Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 32nd meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Could I remind everyone, please, to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? Now, the first item on the agenda is the draft budget scrutiny for this year. This is the first evidence session on the budget support from the Scottish Government and public bodies for the food and drink industry, forming part of the committee's pre-budget scrutiny. Once the Scottish, budgets, uh, Scottish Government's draft budget for 2018-19 is published, the committee will have an opportunity to question the Cabinet Secretary on spending across the whole range of policy areas within the committee's remit, including food and drink. I would like to welcome uh, the first panel, which is James Withers, the Chief Executive of Scotland Food and Drink, uh, David Thompson, Chief Executive, Food and Drink Federation Scotland. Patrick Hughes, the Head of Seafood Scotland. Um, and Scott Lansborough, the Chief Executive of Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation. And Andrew Richardson, the Director of the Society of Independent Brewers. Now, before we go into uh, the evidence session, uh, I would like to declare an interest um, and I believe there will be other panel members that want to declare an interest. And my interest is that I am part of a farming partnership, therefore producing food in Scotland. Uh, Peter, would you like to? I have a de declaration as part of a farming business in, uh, in Aberdeenshire. Okay. Does anyone? Uh, Stuart, do you want to? Uh, I have a registered agricultural holding of three acres. Okay, I think that's all the interest declared. Could I just say, for those of you that haven't given evidence before, if you, if you look at me, um, I will try and bring you in. And if I see you catch my eye, I will, I will bring you in if I can. Um, I will also try and uh, reduce the, the length of answers to the questions if I feel it's getting quite long, so because it's quite a big panel for everyone to get a chance to speak. And also, could I remind you, you don't need to touch any of the buttons in front of you. Once I have, have called you, your light will automatically uh, light up and you'll be able to uh, answer the questions that are put to you. Um, right, I think we'll go on to the first question, which is from Peter Chapman. Thank you, convener, and uh, welcome, uh, gentlemen of the panel. Uh, my question is, is based on, on what's been an absolute success story over the last 10 years. There's no question about it. Scotland's food and drink now worth some 14 billion to the economy and, and, and growing, turnover growing by 44% and exports by 56% in the last 10 years. But we, we aren't content to, to uh, rest on our laurels in the, in the, the you know, the, the uh, expectation is to grow that to, to 30 billion by 2030 which is a, an ambitious target indeed. But So what my question is, uh, what do you think the Scottish food and drink industry needs in terms of support to achieve these aims by 2030? Um, James, you looked up, so uh, you... <laughs> that means that, that, that you lead off, James, if you yeah, please. OK, um, so uh, thanks to the committee again for the opportunity to, to, to come and talk to you this morning. I know we did a session earlier on in the year around the strategy itself that we launched back in March that, that we titled Ambition 2030. And as Peter says, articulated you know, our view that there is an opportunity there of, of growth uh, of the industry you know, to twice the size we are just now. Um, within that strategy, there's some very clear strands for us um, around market development, both in our market here and market overseas, and then the three major capability building areas, so in the area of skills, areas of um, innovation, and the area of supply chain too. Um, I think what I would say is, as a starter is we've got, um, you know, we, we operate quite a deep partnership between industry and the public sector in Scotland, have done for the last 10 years, uh, and it works well. So I, I think it would be fair to say you have a good level of contentment amongst the industry in terms of funding that is going into the sector. It's more complex in Scotland than you'll get in, in other countries. Um, so in countries like Ireland or New Zealand, you tend to have one figurehead public sector body um, where all funding going into the farming, fish and food and drink sector is spearheaded through. In Scotland, we have a more complex landscape with a number of public sector actors and industry bodies, but we've developed a, a close way of working. Um, our view um, is that really the prioritisation of funding for this sector 
um, is absolutely critical going forward. Um, it's difficult to put a number on that, and I think that is one thing that we found uh, sometimes a challenge for the industry, and SPICE have made a good attempt, I have to say, at trying to understand the different levels of funding that exist in different places. Um, greater clarity uh, on those different areas of funding and, and the scale of investment going there, I think, would be helpful. But prioritising investment across those four areas for us will be, will be essential. Market development, skills, innovation, supply chain. One area that, that we're worth in particular to look at, and I think I mentioned it last time we did uh, a session on the strategy earlier on in the year, is um, a few years ago within the, the rural economy budget, uh, as it's now called, there was no food and drink industry development budget at all. It didn't exist as a, as a budget line. Um, and it was welcome to see it there. It's modest, I would say. It sits at about six million at the moment. Um, clearly, we, we have an ambition in growth terms of 14, 15 billion over the next 10 to 15 years. And I think that's an area that's worth looking at because that fund has been used, I think, quite well in recent years. We have a certain level of flexibility to it. Um, there's a new funding agreement between industry and government that's been agreed as part of this strategy, £10 million between industry money and government, I'd like to see that particular budget line move northwards because I think we're going to identify over the next year as we're doing action planning around these key priority areas, some flagship initiatives and gaps in delivery. Um, and it might be, I suppose, maybe a little bit frustrating for the committee that I'm not here with my top five things we'd like to invest money in, but that work is happening um, just now. And I think if we can move that particular budget line northwards, it means that as we identify these opportunities and these priorities, we don't lose then a year in trying to make a funding case. We have funding earmarked to be able to move quite quickly in what's going to be a pretty fast-changing environment. Uh, there's some more detail in my mind around particular market opportunities, but I'll, I'll maybe leave it there for the moment. Um, can I, I, I'm going to bring in Stuart before I, uh, I give somebody else a chance on the panel. You've all been studiously looking away, so I don't know if you're not wanting to answer the question, but maybe Stuart will entice you in with his. Um, we're reading in the press that the cost of food is going up faster than almost anything. Uh, at the moment uh, because of the proportion of our food that's imported. Uh, clearly, the devaluation of the pound should be an opportunity for our exports of food, uh, but that doesn't appear to be happening. Now, given that we're looking to double the size of the industry, uh, is the devaluation of the pound opportunity or threat? Because so far it doesn't seem to be playing out as the former. I'm going, to, I'm going to let Scott come in on that because he, he, he was uh... going to be there. Um, well, I think you, I, I don't know if you noticed our uh, expert figures in the media the other day, but we've benefited from a, a lower pound undoubtedly in the export markets. Our exports are at record highs. Uh, our production's not. Uh, our production is actually um, static at the moment, uh, but we obviously, as you're aware, have some aspirations to grow that. Uh, the, the reduction in the value of the pound is a double-edged sword. Our feed costs are a large part of our production costs, and obviously they've gone up because that's priced in US dollars, so uh, we've had, that's been an impact. But on balance, it is beneficial to us to have a lower pound to uh, export around the world um, because it, we're becoming more attractive compared to our competitor countries. It's really as straightforward as that. Um, and you know, I, I agree with all the things James has said. I think the other thing we have to recognise for producing large quantities, I mean, uh, the good news about Scottish food and drink is that it's high value, it's regarded as premium, but I think in order to get to a number like 30 billion, we'll need to pr be producing a lot more, and that's a capacity challenge. And we need to think about the capacity and how we, how we uh, uh, create that and how we actually can deliver that additional production. So uh, some of the things just, uh, and these are maybe additional points as opposed to mainstream points, but I, I think it's worth bearing in mind that um, we're transporting large tonnage of food from the Western Isles, from the Northern Isles, west coast of Scotland, and we need to ensure our road infra infrastructure is up to uh, speed for that challenge. Um, we think that there's a, a, undoubtedly a, an A85 upgrade as a high priority, as is the A82 and the A830. Now, I know that's a different budget, maybe, from what you people are, are looking at, but nevertheless, it's something to bear in mind. Additionally, the digital and mobile connectivity remains a challenge. Now, our keenest competitors 
are Norway and the Faroe Isles. They're the nearest and keenest competitors, and their connectivity is miles ahead of ours. And I think that's, again, something that we need to bear in, bear in mind. Patrick, do you want to come in on that? I mean, uh, the, the, the value of the pound, has, has that been a benefit to your industry or not? Um, we, we, we're seeing, as Scott has alluded to, that in the, sea, the salmon sector, there's, there's significant growth. We're also seeing growth within the, the white fish sector too, in the pelagic sector. We're noticing that there are increased opportunities within the export market. Um, that works in tandem with the in-market specialists that we have in various different places around the world. And that echoes with the interest going to the likes of the Boston Seafood Show and Brussels, where we're seeing first-time attendees now interested in actually seeking and sort of enhancing their market opportunities from export. In terms to answer sort of uh, to help answer Peter's question as well, in terms of the support, uh, we're currently going out to industry and series of engagement sessions. Um, to understand what, they, what the challenges are and what the aspirations are for the industry to move forward and support and innovation, looking for processors to maybe move towards automation um, is something that, that needs to be looked at. The long-term strategic funding of how these um, initiatives can, can help, for example, we know the EMFF is, is life limited, so therefore having a, a system that replaces that in, in time, um, so we're not necessarily left with a funding gap to potentially move the initiative forward. Also the in-market specialists and the support to, to look at in export markets, not necessarily resting on our, all our, on our laurels and looking to actually sort of see that Scotland is open for business and that we are seeking markets elsewhere. The, the, also, the, the transportation issue, we were up in Shetland last week, um, and one of the key issues that that sector have are, are obviously li linked to the, the freight and the getting off the island, and that sort of chimes with what Scott was saying in terms of linking that all up with transportation and, and distribution. Okay, Peter. Can, I, can I just ask, I mean, uh, James uh, highlighted it's a fairly complex system. There's many funding streams to support the, this the industry, and, do you find that it, it, it is difficult? To, it makes the job more difficult if we could streamline the, the, the systems of support and, and it would help the, the industry? I think, it would give the industry sorry. I think it would give the industry more clarity, absolutely. Um, in terms of EMFF, it's, you know, it, it's been very, very worthwhile, but it is short term. Mm -hmm. um, so having that longer term strategy and that flexibility um, to maybe adapt in the medium term as well. Um, it's very prescriptive in terms of what you have to do, mm -hmm. and if there's a deviation beyond that, it may not um, permit that deviation. Okay. And Andrew, do you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah. Um, just to say that I, um, I have got, I'm actually a manager of a brewery as well as representing SIBA. We don't have any full-time staff in Scotland, so I can talk from personal experience as well as uh, the experience of our members. Um, and overall, I think the support that we get from the Scottish uh, government is excellent. Um, you know, we've got, we've, we, you get the seminars on various topics. There's um, capital expenditure support we've had. There's innovation support, um, support if you go trying to do exports. So it, it's there if you want it. Um, we're lucky that we're, my company's uh, account managed by Scottish Enterprise. So there's one person there who can advise us on what support is available. I think for people who aren't, then it is a bit more difficult, and it's, there's, a, there's a bewildering range of, of opportunities. Um, even this morning, I was chat, just chatting to someone downstairs in reception waiting to come to this meeting room from the Scottish Funding Council, who told me that they've got money um, available for small businesses to work with universities, which I wasn't aware of. Um, so we'll get him along to the next SIBA meeting, and he can tell us about what that's about. But just to say, you know, if I hadn't met him, I wouldn't... You know, how, our average member is is two to three man business. Nose to the grindstone, they, they don't have time to, to, to spend a lot of time looking around, to be frank, you know, they're running their business. So um, I think simplifying it, or as I say, we're lucky, we're account managed and the chat we deal with is excellent and therefore can inform us on what's going on. But if you don't have that, then I think um, it's, it's more difficult. Peter, do you want, is there a follow-up to that? or well, we... The, the follow-up is, I mean, it, how effective do you feel that the support has been to date? And I mean, I kind of answered that question when I, when I, when I started speaking earlier on. You know, the, you, have, you have been a huge success story over the last 10 years. So you might assume that what the, the support mechanisms have been to date have been, have been a success. But 
Um, how, how do you feel about that? Is it, could, I'm, I'm sure that in some ways it could be better. Um, Anybody? Scott. Speaking for my sector alone, uh, alone so um, I think we have unfulfilled uh, demand, basically. Uh, we could, we could, um, we can't, but uh, if we could overnight double our production, uh, it, it would all be in market today and it would be at the same price. So there's an undersupply. And uh, I think that's what, one of the challenges we have. Obviously, we've got to do it in a sensitive way, particularly to the environment and uh, the biology that we're, that we're experiencing at the moment. But I think that there's a huge opportunity for uh, the salmon sector, certainly in world markets. But I think if you look at all, by and large, all the Scottish food brands are pretty high quality. And I think the premium message is just going to grow in demand. And do you feel it's realistic that you can double the, 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 the salmon industry in the next 15, 10, 15 years? Is that, is that, is that realistic in your opinion? I think it's very challenging. Mm. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I like to say that we'll try and grow uh, you know, by around 4% per annum, but to actually put a, a big uh, tonnage number out there I don't think is a, is a good idea. I think we just need to play it by ear. I think there, there are so many uh, variables in, in managing in the natural environment, uh, food production in the natural environment, that you can't, I can't commit us to that particular tonnage. I think it would be silly to do that. And I'm, I'm quite keen to bring you in because uh, I haven't had a chance to yet. I mean, do you want to comment on whether it's been effective, the, the, the funding so far? I, I think it has. I, I mean, there are areas where um, we've already discussed there, there's um, hunger for more, I think. Um, uh, and uh, as been mentioned already, capital expenditure um, support for companies is always something where there's a high demand um, and a limited budget and a limited set of criteria under the food processing and marketing grants uh, that are available. So uh, certainly in, in the experience I've had with those grants, there's always um, a, a, an over supply of eager applicants for those. So that, that's one of the key areas where uh, you can easily point to support that's been available and that has delivered growth. Um, I think also um, uh, we talked about uh, um, uh, the kind of clutter of funding uh, and actually there are some good examples about uh, how the partnership has helped to uh, declutter some of that funding. So uh, last year's uh, launch of Make Innovation Happen, uh, the Innovation Support Service, um, which is backed by over a, a million pounds of Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise money, is a way to uh, actually declutter the innovation landscape and make it easier for firms to access. So now there's just a phone line that you need to uh, uh, talk to and, and specialists who are there who can do that. And on the back of that funding, um, then projects will arise and there's, there's, there's money that's available to support uh, those projects. So that there are areas where work has been done to, to make it simpler for businesses to, to access it. Um, if I may, I wanted to pick up on the, the uh, question that uh, Stuart Stevenson asked around uh, imports and exports. Um, my members, who uh, are quite often some of the larger companies that manufacture in Scotland, uh, are facing pressures, and those pressures are around uh, materials that are imported uh, in order to uh, add to the process in Scotland, some of which you can't get in the UK uh, alone. And the prices of those have obviously gone up with the devaluation in currency, and that's creating cost pressures for uh, a number of my members. Okay. I'm going to bring Mike Rumbles in and then we'll move on to the next question, Mike. I want to ask a devil's advocate question. We're examining the budget. Food and drink is a really successful story. The government's done a good job in supporting the food and drink industry. Maybe it has other priorities now. You can only spend public money once. So if I was the finance minister asking you this question, I'd say where in the budget of financial support to the food and drink industry do you think the finance minister might be able to call a little bit back to put to sort of other areas. Um, James, you're sort of... Claw back out of food and drink spending to mm. put elsewhere. Yes. That is a devil's advocate question. It is. Um, <clears throat> That's why I wondered why you were volunteering to answer it quite so quickly. <laughs> I was volunteering to clarify the question. <laughs> um, geez, that is, a, that is a really difficult one, Mike, and I don't know what the answer is there. What I, I think there is... It would be fair to say that the last 10 years can sometimes be characterised as giving a lot of things a small amount of money rather than potentially looking at what transformational investments might be. So that's a real challenge for something like the Food and Processing Marketing Grant Scheme, which I agree with David, is absolutely critical. You know, uh, do you give 
10,000 businesses some money to buy an oven, or, or do you actually look at a couple of transformational um, processing um, capacity areas we need to invest in? And I think as we go forward, we need to look at maybe how we prioritise some of that investment, because there's an instinctive desire, I think, sometimes for government to spread the money thinly so everyone is a little bit happy as opposed to really prioritising what those key investments are. The challenge for us as industry is to help them do that and make some of those difficult decisions ourselves rather than leaving that with, with government. So my, my, I, I don't approach this discussion by thinking how much I'd like to see the food and drink investment budget go down. Um, so I can't help you particularly with that question. Um, what a surprise. <laughs> say that everyone else has looked away when you yes, asked that question. I, so I wanted the question asked. I'm, I'm probably going to move on to Fulton now to, to ask the next question. Yeah, thanks, convener, and thanks, panel. Hey, good morning, thank you. Thanks for coming along. I probably should just declare that just before you came in, I've just eaten a, a roll and black pudding and potato scones, so definitely done my bit for the food industry, whatever anybody thinks about that particular combination. Um, I was told earlier today it was definitely a Coat Bridge thing, so there you go. My question is kind of following up uh, from Mike, uh, and uh, you know we're talking about the uh, budget just now, and the, the, there's a discussion uh, nationally going on around uh, taxes, particularly <laughs> income tax. What is there anything that you think uh, we can do to help encourage changes that would support the industry? And if so, what would be the key focus in order to achieve that? And happy to take. Take it in any order, really. Pa Patrick, do you want to go with that? I mean, uh, what changes would you like to see as an industry? Just alluding to the the, the engagement session, so uh, we're asking the, the industry what they're looking for support in, and it does vary. Um, the processing sector are looking for help in, in the innovation and in automation. Um, if we are looking at a reduced workforce, which is invariably happening, you know, we've got the northeast of Scotland potentially, on average, 70% of, of migrant workforce to actually make a sustainable future going forward. These businesses are going to have to look at automation. Um, that's challenging for these businesses um, that work on tight margins. Um, there is a factor of de minimis. That means that the, sort of the, the public sector support is, is limited um, to a certain extent. So in terms of what needs to change, um, we need to look at what de minimis support we can give to the sector and also look at ways in which we can help with the, the infrastructure investment for automation and, and moving the, those businesses forward. Okay, um, I'm going to bring Stuart in because, uh, and then widen it out, if I may. It's a very small, specific point to Patrick. Um, at the moment, the European rules, I think, limit investments to €30,000. Uh, is there an opportunity, therefore, once the UK leaves uh, the European Union, to see the state being a bigger player in investment? We, we would certainly like to see that. Um, um, and certainly, if we can get some parity with, with the agricultural sector, that would be great. Um, but then maybe not even limiting that. Um, now is an opportunity to, to look at things in a different way. And we would certainly encourage that. James, you, you nodded at that stage. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I th obviously, you know, the de minimis rules are complex and the difference between agriculture, between agriculture and fishing, between agriculture and fishing and then manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> and I think it does place... Uh, you know, an artificial limit on support that can be plugged into companies where the case for that investment is, is quite strong. There are, I think, as I understand, WTO limits around this as well, so we're not going to be free of, free of these de minimis limits. Um, but I've, I've never been quite convinced what the economic rationale is for the de minimis limits we have, particularly so low at the primary sector. And I suppose back to the point about prioritis prioritisation of funding, whilst you know, I would agree entirely with Peter's comment about the success of the food and drink sector, there are areas where we have been patently less successful, and that particularly that investment and connection between what's happening at the primary end of our supply chain, particularly farming, and the rest of the, the manufacturing sector. Uh, and the more we can um, remove what I would argue are artificial barriers to investment of that, the better I think we'll be able to achieve the kind of ambitions we've got. David, do you want to come in on that? Sure. Um, uh, not, not so much about de minimis, though I, though, though I would absolutely agree with the, 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 the points that both James and, and Patrick have made. But going back to the question about income tax, that was uh, um, uh, the first one. 
I think we, we, over the next couple of years at least, see a massive challenge to the food and drink industry in both manufacturing and primary production, uh, and that's around the issue of workforce. And uh, Brexit or not, um, uh, the, the change in the currency has meant that there are enormous pressures uh, in food manufacturing and in uh, the uh, primary in agriculture and, 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 and in fishing on the workforce as a whole. So one of the questions I think I would... I would ask is, um, is there anything that we, uh, in the income tax proposals that would support um, bringing more people uh, into, uh, into this country to be able to uh, um, do that primary processing and do the, uh, the food manufacturing that, that we'll require and that is critical. Um, so that's one of the areas I would ask. The, the other thing is uh, around uh, the income tax. Uh, a number of my members are, are large companies, uh, sometimes international companies, uh, who move people around. It's part of what they do in terms of management training and, 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 and otherwise. Um, and I think we wouldn't want to see such a differential in tax in, in Scotland as compared to the rest of the UK. That, that makes that tricky for individuals who are on a management track or who are developing their skills and potential as well. Uh, Fulton mentioned income tax. I'm sure it would be, I mean, if, if anyone wants to, in, to widen that out to business rates or other form of taxation, I'm sure that would be appropriate. Fulton, do you want to follow that up? No, actually, just um, that was the only point I was perhaps going to make if uh, people were just going to focus on income tax and the question so far that, you know, as the convener says, feel free uh, to, to widen it out in the, the last two answers. Scott, do you want to say something on that? Well, just kind of to endorse uh, what David has said, I think there are two pressures. One is the, uh, you know, the primary processing end, if you like, the, the lower skill workforce. Um, I, I hear, and this is not necessarily from my sector, that uh, the, the attractiveness of uh, working in Scotland for relatively low wages in the past has been the value of the currency compared to home. And as the currency is de devalued, then it's not as attractive. Uh, and that's obviously putting pressure on, on uh, a number of uh, parts of the uh, primary processing sector. Uh, so that's one pressure. The other pressure for us is um, we now have a strong demand for people with high engineering skills in our sector. Uh, strategically significant for us because we're about to invest in large-scale recirculating aquaculture systems for the production of juvenile salmon. Uh, which is all part and parcel of the um, you know, managing the environment in a, in a better, more effective way. And uh, you know, and, and I'm not talking maybe half a dozen. We're probably talking, uh, you know, in the hundreds eventually, where we'll, we'll be needing highly skilled people. And you know, that's the other pressure, if you like, that to, to attract these people and to keep them and to give them a good career. Obviously, they're in an international marketplace for. For that and will it's just a question mark i'm not giving an opinion here it's just we have to be careful uh, when we're looking at differential rates and in, in income tax uh, with regard to that side it, fulton if you're happy with that because that neatly leads on to the next question which is from the deputy convener gail ross Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, James Withers talked about the three pillars of strategy in the um, Ambition 2030, and I want to concentrate on pillar one, um, people and skills. And the last time you were in, uh, we discussed the possibility of a foundation apprenticeship in the industry. And then at the Food and Drink Federation event in the Scottish Parliament, Minister Jamie Hepburn went on to announce that there is going to be uh, such a foundation apprenticeship, which was great news. Um, I was interested as well to hear about the um, need for more engineering type skills and, and people in the workforce as well. And uh, we know that the Scottish Funding Council have £37 million to invest in the sector. Do you feel that the um, money is being spent in the right areas? And how do we know that it's providing the right training? And do you think that we're getting good value for money? Quite a lot of questions there. Who'd like to... Uh... Who'd like to uh, start off? David, do you want to start with that? I, I can start off on, on some of the skills work that, 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 that's uh, being done. Um, uh, so uh, as part of the Food and Drink Federation, we get support from the Scottish Government to do work on um, uh, using the food and drink industry as a career. And we work with uh, a wide range of schools and we create partnerships between schools and businesses and have done for uh, uh, many years now. And, and a lot of those partnerships are very well developed. Uh, what we also do uh, is we work with um, our, our, the education providers. So we work with Skills Development Scotland, we work with College Development Network, we work with the Scottish Qualifications Authority on making sure that we 
would have the right uh, types of uh, degree and other course available uh, for those who want to pursue a career in food and drink, and in particular in technology. Um, so what that means is we've, uh, we have developed uh, school level courses and we have supported universities uh, and others to target their courses uh, better and we also have worked with a range of colleges to make sure that they've got the right course there and that means that we're helping uh, SQA and others uh, develop a new higher national uh, di diploma in food uh, science and technology. Um, so there's a range of activity that's going on to try and align the courses and uh, the types of uh, experience that are available to young people so they can see a clear career path into the industry. And that's one of the ways that we are helping in particular around the, the science and technical uh, subjects. So I just wanted to make sure that that, that that was there to show that there is, again, support from the Scottish Government and uh, support from industry to try and um, um, make that career path clear. Andrew, do you want to come in on that? Very briefly, um, at, a, at a more senior level, the, the Herit Watt of uh, about the only brewing and distilling course, I think, in, in the UK at the moment. So the, the Herit Watt Mafia are everywhere. Uh, we've had three graduates from Herit Watt and been very good, although they tend to be very theoretical rather than practical, um, which is, is, so it takes four or five months before they, you, you can let them alone. But they're fine. They're, they're very good. On the apprenticeship level, there's a lot of desire for skills training in the industry. Um, and I think, you know, we'd welcome it. I, again, one of my lift conversation coming up here today was with someone from the Skills Development Scotland who told me that they have now developed um, an apprenticeship scheme for brewing, which is great news. Um, so hopefully he'll come along to the Society of Independent Brewers and tell us what that looks like. Um, but that's the sort of thing I think that people will, will genuinely get behind. Um, you know, you do, it, it, it makes business sense to have, in particular in small companies, people you can rely on, you can leave alone, who will do what you want them to do without uh, you know, needing constant supervision. So there is a desire to, to have people trained up. Well, I mean, you mentioned skills. So, I mean, do you want to comment on the, the money that's available for, through the S well, SFC? Yeah, may, maybe a specific uh, is, is, is a request, really. Uh, we, we have an ageing workforce uh, in, in salmon industry. Uh, it's been going for 40 years now. We actually have quite a lot of people over the age of 25, and we would like to um, basically enter them into an ME programme, a modern apprenticeship programme, because a lot of these people now require different skills to the ones they, they originally entered the industry with. Uh, and, and I think that would be of enormous benefit to us to actually uh, upskill the, the over 25s now in this country. Gail, do you want to come, mm. come back on that? That's an interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that as an industry, as a whole, we're getting the right people in the right place, or are there any gaps that you can identify that maybe the money could be better allocated in, in other places? <coughs> David, do you want to...? I, I, well, I think it's clear to, to us from uh, feedback from our members that it is in the science and technical and engineering uh, side of things, so that ranges from uh, new product development uh, to some uh, machinery engineering uh, and people who hit things with hammers uh, and know precisely where to hit them. So there's a, the, that, that's, that's absolutely the, the, the area where the industry tell us that there, there, there is a, a great need and that's why we're um, uh, focusing our attention on those types of qualifications. I'm going to bring Stuart in, then I'd like to see Patrick, if you've got uh, uh, something to add to that. So Stuart, if I could start off with you. It's perhaps David and Scott. Um, our biggest competitors in salmon by a long way are the Norwegians, uh, where the tax rates are about 50% higher than they are here. And yet I hear they're not experiencing some of the difficulties in getting engineering staff that we're experiencing. Why? Uh, Scott, if there's a simple answer to that. There's um... no simple answer to that, I'm afraid, but uh, there's, a, there's a societal thing there. Uh, I mean, there are all sorts of, it's a different style of living. Um, the, 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 undoubtedly, there's a, a better infrastructure uh, spend in, in Norway um, that benefits uh, particularly a disparate industry such as salmon. Um, and people enjoy the benefits of that. Um, Again, a lot of this is cultural, so it's a difficult thing to answer. Uh, Norwegians tend to holiday in Norway. We tend to travel the world, look at uh, the millions of people who go in and out of Edinburgh Airport every year. So you know, there are quite a number of different pros and cons to that. I, I'm, I'm not advocating that 
I don't know what you're advocating, Stuart. I just, I'm just saying um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open question. It's a very big question. I think, uh, we, you know, we, I, I know uh, the Parliament and the Government are testing the water, and I think that's the appropriate approach at the moment. Um, it's, it's a difficult one. Patrick, do you want to, to come in on skills specifically in your industry? Um, yeah, again, due to sort of labour shortages, it's typically on, on, it's not dissimilar to other industries where it's not a, an attractive place um, to work. So therefore, <coughs> trying to seek new entrants across the supply chain, even from the catching sector right through to the processing sector, it does prove challenging. Um, but uh, we need to... And, and as um, David's alluded to, the foundations are in place to actually, once people are in, the, the, the systems are actually there to help them. We just need to do a bit more work to actually up, up sell the industry as a whole, um, as an attractive place to work and, and an effective career choice. So that, I think that's quite an interesting point. Uh, Peter wants to pick up on it. Specifically, the, the part like about the, the catching sector, it's, it used to be, it used to be these, these uh, boats, fishing boats, were all crewed by local folks. Nowadays, it seems to be that it's increasingly difficult to, to attract local people, local youngsters to, to crew these boats, and we've got Filipino crews and all sorts of issues with that. Um, do you feel that that's beginning to turn around and we can train up the, 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 the local young guys to, 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 to see a, an, a, a future in the fishing industry? Um, um, a catching sector organisation yesterday, and they're starting to see it, but, but they've laid, laid the foundations in place. They're, they're giving new entrants an opportunity to actually go out in, into the sector and, and catch. Um, there are limitations, whether that's due to boat licensing and everything else, but um, there, there are opportunities, and we're, we're not there yet. We're not seeing that influx of local people, um, but we need to try and get that rural infrastructure in place, try and get, get people into the sector, absolutely. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on to the next question, which is uh, Rhoda. That's your question next. My question is about the supply chain. Um, and we've had a problem, I think, in Scotland with the length of supply chains in the past and indeed distance um, from the consumer. So how can we address that? And is the funding that is going into supply chain being used to make sure that producers understand their customers' needs, both home and abroad? David, do you want to start on that? And then I'll probably bring James in afterwards. Uh, sure. I mean, uh, James has already alluded to the fact that uh, one, of, one of the key um, uh, areas in Ambition 2030 that we've uh, really focused on is making sure um, that uh, that work on supply chains actually results in farmers and fishermen feeling like they're part of the great success of the food and drink industry, because that's something where, you know, there has been a lack over, o over the past few years. Um, so. Absolutely, the, the, the work that's going on by the Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society and a range of others in terms of cooperation and working with the supply chain is, is fundamental to the success of uh, Ambition 2030. Um, I think there's, you know, philosophically, um, there, there is a, um, a difference between kind of logistical efficiency um, and, the, and, and supply chains and, uh, and even short supply chains. So there's a whole range of quite tricky issues for the industry there. So if consumers want uh, goods, that, goods that are uh, high quality but a low price, then you know, part of that is to make sure that the logistics work. Um, and, and what that tends to mean is that you, 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 you have longer supply chains and it tends to mean, you, mean that you have um, uh, larger distribution centres. Um, uh, and the type, some of the types of businesses that I work with, that's the way that they have success. Um, so there's no one size fits all here, uh, but I think there is still massive opportunity to uh, um, yeah, support the supply chain and to do more uh, in terms of uh, shortening that supply chain where it's appropriate to do so and where it has an advantage for Scotland's fishermen and farmers. James, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with David entirely. I think there's two parts to the supply chain investment for me. One is about um, capital investment and particularly in processing facilities. Um, but the, the first part really is around the work that the likes of SUS do, where they really act as that honest broker between manufacturers, primary producers, to look at um, having much more collaborative supply chains. We've had quite a, I mean, historically, 
I suppose in some, at worst, a fairly adversarial relationship between, say, farmers and, and processors with the view that only one of those partners can make money at any given time, whereas actually there are good models of much more collaborative supply chains. So market-driven supply chains is a really important um, project. Uh, it's uh, coordinated by Scottish Enterprise, funded by a number of public sector partners. Um, I think it's about a million pounds going into that project. Um, you know, I think that's the kind of investment we need to see much more of. And there's very clear returns on investment for that. You know, you will see multiples of that investment being uh, generated in terms of um, sales impact and growth impact um, as a result of that kind of investment. The, the capital investment, though, is important, and I think that's one as a Brexit-related issue, FPMC, the Food Process Marketing Grant Scheme, has been talked about a couple of times. It's absolutely critical funding stream. Um, comes from Europe just now. Um, as we leave the European Union, we're going to have to find a mechanism to continue those kind of capital injections to the right projects at, at the right time, because that has really helped drive on the growth we've seen over the last few years. Like David, I think there's a real delicate balance between having you know, local processing facilities versus Scotland-wide processing facilities. For me, I think the priority is to be adding as much value as we can to our raw material in Scotland. So not see product leave Scotland to be processed and then come back in. And I think there are opportunities to do that in a number of ways. And we, we've, I suppose it's been talked about in the red meat sector um, for some time. That said, in some circumstances, having you know, smaller processing facilities at a very localised level, level can be really viable because it really enhances that provenance story behind the product, you know, produced in an area, processed in an area and sold in an area. I'm going to bring Scott in and then I'm going to bring John in. And Patrick, um, you're definitely, I mean, I would like to get you all, all in on this question because I, I think it's really important. And as far as uh, Patrick's concerned, I mean, supply chains and, and making sure some of the produce stays local, I know will be of interest to, to people, especially in your industry. So if I bring Scott in and then I'm going to bring John in and, and come back to the other. Scott, would you like to talk on supply chains? Um, really just to reiterate what the others have said, uh, I mean, our supply chain works pretty well, but I think where we maybe are uh, underperforming is in um, secondary processing. A lot of it's going into, it's still going to Poland to be processed, smoked, um, and I think we miss an opportunity there. But again, that, that will be a, 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 the challenge there will be labour market um, to, to get that right. I think um, we, we don't seek any funding for... Uh, developing processing plants. We've already recently built a, a large one in, in Rosyth, as you know, and there's more coming uh, in, in the West Coast as well. So uh, we're, we're quite comfortable with that. I think the, the key for us is perishable product. So the, the, so the whole supply chain has to work very efficiently because, you know, we, we want to get to our destination uh, to, to, to be able to uh, be distributed to the consumer within 48 hours maximum. Uh, and and we, we achieve that. We achieve that. 60 countries around the world from the, some of the remotest parts of this country. So, you know, it's, it is working reasonably efficiently. I think the, the, I go back to my uh, earlier point about transport infrastructure. It's dependent on that. It's dependent on that really uh, being upgraded as regularly as it can be. Uh, and, the, you know, the support to the ferry system is welcomed, uh, welcome and, and uh, long may that continue because it's very important for us. Okay. John, do you want to... Yeah, I mean, take the point that the system's working efficiently. I just wonder if the, the, the rewards are shared out evenly. I mean, I was checking one of my local restaurants. I could get haddock and chips tonight for £12, fillet of beef for £25. Uh, and at the same time, we're told that 36% of farm businesses made a loss. Uh, more than half of farm businesses generated income roughly equivalent to less than the minimum agricultural wage. I mean, if we lost 36% of our farms, how, how can we possibly grow... The, our food and drink industry. So, you know, th that kind of raises the question with me, is that although the supply chain may be working, is it, is it fair the way things are? And, and can government do anything about that or is that just something we have to leave to the market? Um, who'd like, uh, I, I would like to bring Patrick in on the, the, su uh, the supply chain and, and, and keeping maybe, or making food available local. And then perhaps we can pick up on John's point. So Patrick, would you like to start on, on, on the Previous question, chain, yes. and then I'll pick up the others. <clears throat> um, shorter supply chains are obviously vitally important, especially within within the seafood sector. We have a, a, an issue in in the processing sector at the moment where we are we have reduced capacity. There, there's ever increasing reducing capacity. We need to reverse that trend. Um, goes back to some of the points that I made earlier, but. Um, 
We also need to make sure that we retain the added value in Scotland. We have the markets um, in, in Peterhead and in, in Lurwick in particular that are reinvesting in, in the sort of the fish auctions there. Um, if we are not careful, the processing ability and capacity that we have, will, it will basically just flow through Scotland and go to somewhere where, where it can be processed. So we need to make sure that we capture that supply chain within Scotland. Um, and that links back to transportation and, and investment within, um, within the industry too. Um, making, making seafood more available, um, we, we need to be working closer, closer with um, public procurement to make sure that we are getting local um, fish on, on menus. We're seeing examples of that with Highland Council, um, uh, putting Scottish salmon on their menus as well, which is great. Um, so there are, there are small elements of success to try and increase the sort of the local um, seafood offering, but, but yeah, they're absolutely right, there's more could be done. Who'd like to pick up on uh, John's particular point on, I, I guess it was farm gate prices, and, and I don't know what the equivalent is in the fishing industry, but there must be a saying there. James, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of cuts to the heart, really, of this whole issue of, you know, we've got a, a booming food and drink industry, but how many farmers are feeling that, that boom effect? And the reality is not enough. The, you know, Scotland has, if not the, certainly amongst the highest beef prices in the world. Um, and yet we have a lot of particularly, you know, hill producers that will struggle to, to see profitability this year. Um, it's a complex pattern. My, my, my view is that the answer has a, has a number of parts to that. One, it's about markets. So um, Scotland cannot and should not be a commodity producer in terms of agriculture. I think we need to forget about playing the commodity market. It's about premiumisation. And our most successful industry is whisky. Our second most successful is salmon. Both of them have premiumised their product. So that means a balance of markets. 90% of the Scotch beef that we sell is sold in the UK. Um, it's completely the reverse for whisky. Um, so we need to keep internationalising our sector. That has particular challenges in red meat because Scotch beef is still banned in mainland China. It's still banned in Japan and it's effectively still banned in the likes of the US. So the UK, post-Brexit, if we're in a new uh, global trading mentality, has to prioritise those kind of certification issues in third countries. Uh, and I don't think they have done historically. Um, so mix, markets and premiumisation will be critical. I think the other the, the bit, the, the you know, averages are probably particularly um, irrelevant sometimes in farming because the gap between the top third performing farmers and the bottom third performing farmer is, is huge. Uh, and few other sectors would tolerate it. Um, but the, the support system has, um, if you like, in some ways cushioned farmers from that, from that market. So the support system will be critical going forward. We, nail, we need livestock producing uh, production in you know, the 85% of Scotland, which doesn't lend itself to any other kind of agricultural production. But as the, you know, the, in that spice briefing paper around how we're investing funding in farming, fish and food and drink, the single biggest element is agricultural support, you know, 400, 500 million. And we need to think very, very quickly around the future generation of that support and in particular the kind of outcomes we want. So a support in the way which encourages farmers to um, drive efficiency, um, get closer to the market, I think will be, will be absolutely critical. Um, but there's no doubt that the, the, that ongoing support will be you know, central to keeping that supply of product coming through. But we need to premise that product, access markets that we're currently still locked out of, and think about how we drive greater efficiency on farm. And the final element of the on farm bit is we cannot cooperate enough, you know, between farm businesses. And again, the likes of SUS do a huge amount of work in fostering cooperation and collaboration. And I think in the UK, we've probably been 10, 20 years behind other countries in terms of agricultural cooperation, even though we've got probably some sectors doing it very well just now. Uh, James, can I just push you slightly on that? I mean, uh, you know, I, I've made it clear I do have a farm business, and, I, and I've seen, I've seen barley prices being the same as what my father received 30 years ago, and it would be the same for most farmers. And those barley's going to the, one of the premium industries that you're suggesting in Scotland, and that's our whisky industry. Do you think? Do you think? that farm gate prices are a fair reflection of the work that our farmers are putting in, or do you think they're not sharing enough? I don't, I, I don't think we have an equitable share of the success that is being felt at the market end of food and drink back down through the supply chain. Uh, I mean, why, why would you know, a whisky company pay £100 and Fifty pounds a ton for malting barley because they can. Um, so I think a large part of that is about cooperation, the industry working collectively. Um, I think also more and more, if Scotland is selling its product on a provenance story, and obviously Scotch whisky doesn't have to use 
uh, Scottish barley. It's not part of the PGI. Uh, over 90% of it will be. Um, but I think the whole supply chain needs to think if that provenance story is going to mean something going forward, more and more it will have to be about right back to source, right back to farm gate. So a greater value of that raw material coming from the farm gate and much more collaborative supply chains, open book supply chains are going to be critical going forward. And maybe in answer to the question about future support, we need to help prioritise that support more. So if we're going to be giving capital grants to companies, actually what are the requirements of those companies? You know, how are they working collaboratively with producers? How are they tapping into international markets? How are they helping to build that Scottish brand and try and target that support into companies that are embracing those kind of uh, principles? Okay, David, do you want to come in? And then I'd like to bring in Richard, who's got a question. Sure, and I, I, I would, I would agree um, uh, with uh, everything that James said there. The, the, the thing that I wanted to highlight is uh, with uh, Brexit and with the change in farming support and fishing support, then there is a fantastic opportunity now to, to, to rethink that support that's available to farmers and fishermen and, and find ways to, to, to help them in, uh, in a different way than, than, than was previous. And that's something that is obviously part of this budget process as well and thinking uh, how that goes forward. Forward. The critical thing is, um, you know, we have a set amount of money, part of which is part of the European re rebate. So, you know, we, we, we must secure that for our farmers and for our fishermen. Um, I think the second part is I wouldn't want um, uh, to not note here that food processing itself is a high volume, uh, you know, low margin business. So um, there, there, are, there are companies that, um, that, that I represent where they're, they're, they're making half a percent or one percent on everything that they uh, that they make, so it, you know, it's not like necessarily all uh, uh, um, all food processors and manufacturers are, 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 are sitting on piles of cash either. So, as part of that, the whole supply chain needs to benefit. Sorry, I'm going to go back to Rhoda first and then come to Richard. Sorry, Rhoda. Yes, it seems to me from the evidence we've heard that where the supply chain is owned almost by the producer and the salmon industry, the whiskey industry, that that actually adds to the profitability of that industry where things seem to fall down is where the producers are simply producing to sell, maybe on the open market at auction or whatever. So there, I suppose, at the vagaries of the, of the market, and we've seen in dairy to an extent where, where producers got together and, you know, there probably could be an argument whether that was good, bad or indifferent, but it could have helped them um, to get through the really difficult times. So is there a need for more co-ops and, and ownership, those co-ops owning kind of the, the supply chain to the end producer. Would that, would that be a direction of travel that we should maybe be investing in? Scott, do you want to go with that? More, more co-ops in the salmon uh, um, industry? Well, uh, I mean, what, what you're advocating really is vertical integration, which has worked to, to a certain extent for ourselves. Um, it's, not, it's not wholesale across the, uh, the, the salmon sector. We, we still uh, supply a large part of the processing industry, and that's a market um, exchange, if you like. Uh, I get complained uh, to by various uh, people about the farm gate prices, so there's obviously a pressure there, uh, but then that's the market dealing with it. So um, I, I think the trend, though, and it maybe reflects, Stuart was asking about Norway, the Norwegian industry is more uh, vertically integrated than we are at the moment, and I think that will be the direction of travel. And if we don't do that, then the, the other side of this is, every, you know, there's always a risk reward. Uh, the risk is that more processing will go to a country that can uh, process cheaper. That's the other side of it. So, um, you know, so we, we in recent years have noticed an awful lot of uh, salmon processing going to Poland. Uh, and, and, and that's something we want to obviously want to avoid. We want to keep it here. As James, James says, we, we're a Scottish premium product. That's our that's our whole pitch. Is it's about the heritage of Scotland and the premium food that comes from Scotland, and therefore we want that to be fully traceable back through the, the whole Scottish food production chain. I'm going to bring James, and then I'm going to bring Andrew in because I think it'd be interesting to hear from his sector, and then go to to Richard. So, James, do you want to contribute to that? Yeah, I mean, I think vert vertical integration has has um, some real attributes to it, and you know, in, in Scott's sector, there isn't really a debate about farmers versus processors because they're the same thing, uh, they're the same business. Um, I, I would say that co-ops have a huge role to play, but I think it's almost cooperation with a 
small c rather than cooperatives that I think is critical going forward. Some of that is about you know mentality on, on both sides. Um, you know, and in my old days working for um, for NFU, when when prices were low, we had farmers desperately getting us to encourage the big whiskey companies to offer fixed price contracts. Then when prices went high, we had farmers desperately urging us to advise them how they can get out of their contracts. Um, so there's something about um, you know, being able to, to lock in production to a price where a farm business knows it can make money versus potentially still having some of the product that it can play about in the spot market and the auction market. But I do think we need, um, you know, probably clearer contracts, more transparent contracts and greater commitment on all sides. And I would say from retailers and food service downwards, not just manufacturing farmers, to um, contracts where everyone can make a um, can make a buck out, out of the job. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need to own the processing, although I would absolutely support that in, in some cases, that, that greater cooperation, collaboration, and supply chain should be able to make that happen. And there's some examples where that has, has worked before. Andrew, do you want to come in, and then I'm going to go to Richard. Right, yeah. Um, I don't have too much to say on this, but um, I think we, in a way, we're similar to farmers in that we're quite a fragmented market. There's, there's so many small brewers now. Um, and in any market where you've got fragmented suppliers but concentrated buyers, as in, say, supermarkets, then you're going to face um, a, a, an unequal relationship. Um, and that's what we face. There's no doubt that you know, the boot is on the foot of the buyer um, in, in, our, in the, the case of our industry. Um, it's up for every company to, to manage that as best they can. Clearly, from a consumer point of view, they're delighted because they're getting good quality beer cheap. Now, who wouldn't want that? Um, and you start saying, no, you've got to pay the brewer more, then you've got to pay the farmer more, and then you pay everyone else more. And at the end of the day, that means your beer is going to cost more. And that, that's, you know, but that's the market we live in. <laughs> you know, that's, and we all, we all knew that when we got into it, was um, unless you're a, a giant, then you're going to be, um, you're going to have to make, make do as best you can in the, in the market with prices that aren't set by you. Um, to some extent, you can set your prices, but there is a market rate for what you can sell your beer at, and that's the rate. Um, so, I don't see an easy solution to that, to be frank, because I, as I've been through it, I, I, uh, without putting up prices to consumers at the end of the day, um, I don't see an easy solution to, to ensuring, guaranteeing small suppliers that they'll always have a good income. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. A lot of our members are not making a lot of money, but, you know, that's, that's I'm afraid I think that's life. I don't, I don't know, we're not looking for government support in that. I mean, it's... What do you do? Richard, do you want to come in with your... Yeah, I've actually got a few questions, but, um, you know, the, the one that Andrew was going on about, if you actually set your prices at a, a fair price, then you may sell, you sell more at simple economics. But uh, <clears throat> if I move on to Scotts Landberg uh, and uh, Patrick Hughes, I actually have a fish processing plant in Uddingston in my constituency. Previously visited one in Aberdeen a few years ago when I was on the health committee. But the point I want to make to you guys is if we want to uh, sell more, we need to produce more. So, two things. Watched the programme a few, a few weeks ago on the television. All the fish that's caught in Scottish waters uh, under flags of convenience, maybe a, a, a British flag, but it's landed in Holland or landed in, in, in foreign ports. What do we do about that? And basically, also for you, Scott, if we... Norway has a lot of fjords, fjords, um, you know, you're getting hassle from people about, um, you know, uh, where fish uh, salmon fish farms are. So if we want to produce more and sell more, how do we do it? To Patrick first, because I think the the question of where to land your fish, you might you might want to comment on, and then maybe to Scott because the question was directed at both of you. I think Patrick. Well, obviously, there's a requirement for, for Scottish fish within the processing sector. Um, so if we can get uh, Scottish boats to land in Scottish ports, um, then, then that's obviously an advantage to the processing sector in Scotland, and that helps to retain the value within, within Scotland. Um, but on, in saying that, um, there, it, it, is a global, it is a global market, and therefore we can't necessarily dictate where, where boats land. I mean, they are, they are free to, to land wherever and, and create the prices that they get for that, from that marketplace. What we do find is similar to, um, to what James was alluding to earlier, is that 
some businesses in some of the processing sector are actually buying on contract. So we do have the boats landing at an agreed price and, and, and they are benefiting from that too. Um, that's really all I can say in terms of the, the mar market situation. How are we going to raise rent? So we want to double it. Yeah. You want to double your process and you're saying that uh, in, in the processing plan I went into it was it was like magic, you know, fantastic from end to end. Uh, superb company, I won't name them because I think that'd be unfair, but uh, located in Nuddingston. Basically <laughs> <laughs> That's a plug for them. Um, but basically but ba oh, on yes, that plug. I, so how, how, do, how do we double our production if we don't have the fish? Well, I mean, it, it, part of it is basically go back to what to what James and Scott have said earlier. It's it's, it's Scottish Scottish premium product, so therefore, it's not necessarily looking to double the production. It's looking to double the value. So therefore, we need to actually put more value on the product that we actually produce and potentially command greater price for that product that we produce. But you are right. We need to look at the throughput of some of these of these factories as well because that not, not only retains um, the factories but also retains the jobs within those factories too um, yeah we, we it's just simply looking at how how we could potentially ensure that we get more product through that market and that looks at more sustainable supply chains and looking at the catching sector and working closely with the process sector scott i'm going to bring you in but i hope there's no fish processing plants in Richard's uh, constituency that you're going to mention? Oh, no, I won't mention them, although I believe salmon does go through there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you asked about <clears throat> how do we produce more? Uh, I mean, basically, this is probably for another day, but I mean, we have an aspiration to grow. We want to grow. Uh, UNFEO tells us that without doing any selling, we, our demand for salmon protein will grow by 8% per annum. It's just the, the, the way the, the, the demand for high quality protein is going. Now we're farming the sea. Farming the sea is not easy. Uh, you all know the um, uh, things that are laid at our door in the media these days. It's been tough. Uh, the last few years has been particularly tough. It's, it's, all, uh, it's, it's implied it's on account of farming practices. It's really on account of climate change. Climate change has an enormous impact on uh, the marine environment in Scottish waters in the last few years. I, I can tell you in certain parts of the West Coast, our average sea temperatures have risen by 15%. Now just relate that to yourself. If you're living in a, an ambient temperature of 60 degrees and it goes on by 15%, you will have to change. You'll have to change how, how, how you behave. And that's what our fish are having to do. And we're having to take them through there. So it, it has been tough. Next year, our outturn will reduce by around 12,000 tonnes. We've been static since the turn of the century. Uh, we haven't been growing. And that's because we've been taking the, the considered decision to, um, uh, how can I put it, minimize control reduce our production in order to control all the all the things you read about in the media about the, uh, that are affecting uh, salmon at sea sea lice um, algal blooms uh, plankton that's foreign to our waters all these things are causing gill irritations that are challenging the health of our fish now the health of our fish is paramount to us there's been a lot of talk in the media about mortality in, in, in our industry. Mortality is the last thing we want. Believe me, why would we want mortality? So we want to grow, and, and, the, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to change and innovate the way we're going to do it. And a lot of that will be about what I spoke earlier on about recirculating aquaculture systems in the freshwater environment, which will mean shorter time at sea. And that's how we're going to grow. And I believe we will grow significantly in the next 10 to 15 years on account of adopting highly skilled, highly capital intensive, intensive innovative programs. What I'd like to do is I'd like to bring in John, if I may, and then go to James. Uh, and then if I've got time before we move on to the next question, I'll bring in a couple of others. So, John, you want to? Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. Panel, I'm, I'm looking at this briefing and it's talking about food and drink as uh, one of Scotland's growth sectors. And it's, it's really just a fundamental question, um, um, in part linked to the comment that Mike um, Rumbles said, perhaps in jest. But why should... Um, well, no, I thought it was a very pertinent question. Um, why should public money go to fund increased profits? Surely public money goes to fund the provision of food. 
uh, and jobs for our nation. So th there's been a lot of talk about growth. Should you not be aspiring to be reducing the level of public investment? I mean, we're scrutinising the Scottish Government's budget. This is one aspect of a whole range of issues. Should you not be uh, aspiring to having no public money if you really are operating in a the capitalist system? I'm going to ask James to answer that first, and then I'll come to you, Scott, and, and I'll look for other people to enter if they want to. So, James, do you want to come? Yeah, I think, you know, it's a, per a perfectly valid question, uh, and you might argue as, as the most successful and fastest-growing sector in Scotland at the moment, it's the one that least should be targeted for public sector investment. Um, my view is about the size of the opportunity and the size of the prize. So food and drink is, is Scotland's biggest employer, about 115,000 people, uh, and we've identified a growth opportunity. Uh, and I, would, I suppose I would, you know, I think the, the parliament and the government would welcome oil and gas, textiles, tourism, financials are all coming saying this is the size of our opportunity. So our view is that the level of investment that goes in, even if you accumulate everything that's in the briefing paper you just referred to, um, is a very, very small investment compared to the return on activity that comes from that. Um, so I think the... Sorry? The return for whom? Scotland uh, PLC. So I would say, so in terms of jobs, so that we think there's going to be 27,000 new job opportunities just in the next five years. Um, we've got... And who's going to fill these jobs? Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a skills issue. So investment in skills will be critical. The industry absolutely has to do that. So the onus around getting that labour gap filled is about the industry talking about opportunities and raising awareness of the sector. But we've got a jobs growth situation. We've got startup business rates have increased by 81%. Levels of R&D investment are up 71%. So the amount of investment that the industry itself is putting in is significant too. And I think it's a perfectly valid challenge and the part the way the partnership should work here which i think is unique in food and drink between industry and government is that industry should challenge government where we need investment and government should challenge industry and say well what are you going to deliver in return how much are you going to invest so the the, the 10 million pound funding announcement that was made when the strategy was launched is 2.25 million that the industry is putting in so so we're putting our investment on the table in return for government funding and to me that should be the model the model going forward. Um, but if we don't deliver, we don't grow, we don't create new jobs, we don't drive sales, then um, as a taxpayer, I would tell the Scottish Government to put the money elsewhere. But I don't think they should do because I think we can deliver a growth agenda. Scott, I'm going to let you come in and then I'm afraid time-wise we're going to have to move on to the next section. So, Scott. Very briefly, John. Um, we, we don't believe we take very much public money. We do in innovation. We've, uh, the Scottish Government has been uh, tremendously supportive of innovation in our sector, the Scottish Agriculture Innovation Centre, and we're hoping that that will continue. Uh, and we do, to a certain extent, in skills. We, we are operating in a global market. We're marketing, selling to 60 countries around the world. Our competitor countries, I can assure you, are upskilling with significant government support. Stuart mentioned earlier how highly taxed the Norwegians are. A lot of that goes back into investing in their strategic industries. They consider salmon to be a strategic industry. Not only do they invest directly into that, and I can tell you, by the way, that their budget for marketing salmon, and Norwegian salmon in the UK, is £28 million this year. Right? So that's why there's more Norwegian salmon sold in the UK than Scottish salmon. And, and, and that sort of support we're up against. And additionally, they've got... Uh, road infrastructure that's second to none, connectivity that's second to none. That I know it's it's you know it's it's, it's a hard call, but that, that's what we're looking for. And 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 there's a return to everybody uh, with that. Okay, um, uh, John, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to leave that there. Jamie, yours is the next question. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. I think that segues nicely into my first question that I'd been uh, building up over the course of the. Proceedings, and that was around another issue of public spend on Scotland's food and drink. And this instance, one that perhaps benefits local businesses across Scotland, that's the issue of public procurement. Um, I think it's, it's not in our briefing, but it is worth talking about it whilst we have the opportunity today. Um, we know that around £150 million pounds is spent on uh, public procurement of food and drink. I'm um, reliably told around half of that is spent on local produce, but there's anecdotal evidence of huge amounts of public money being spent uh, on overseas food and drink being imported, perhaps uh, more could be done to encourage uh, all aspects of uh, the public sector to buy locally. For example, we know over a million pounds uh, is spent on chicken from Thailand, for example. We're buying potatoes from France, carrots from Belgium, raspberries from Serbia. It seems a bit bonkers in my view. So what does the panel think about what government can do to improve that? David, I'm going to come to you to start off with. 
Um, I, I think it, uh, it's important to recognise that there's been significant growth in those stats over the past 10 years or so. So, so there's been uh, a lot of government action uh, on that already. But there is, of course, uh, more that can be done. Um, I think uh, it's important, uh, uh, and going back to um, the issue of farmers uh, and, and primary uh, producers, it's important that um, they are supported as much as possible to be able to access public sector contracts, and that might mean uh, making sure public sector contracts are small enough for local uh, opportunity there. Um, I think it's important that, uh, in particular, if we're looking to give public support to processing and, and other elements, that we have a look at some of those opportunities and the opportunities that you've kind of outlined in terms of uh, import substitution that we might be able to do. And sometimes that is just because the processing capacity isn't there to be able to uh, uh, meet that market opportunity in the public sector. So I think some of the uh, funding that um, uh, could be made available should be made available to projects that might meet the market. So, um, you know, I think there are a range of things to do. I think the easy stuff has been done, though. Um, so I think the, the next stage is probably going to be more difficult and, uh, you know, again, plays to the... Um, uh, that's where government support and, and help uh, can help, um, in particular, primary producers access the, the public sector market. Um, Patrick, do you want to say anything about that uh, uh, local procurement of, of, of your seafood? Or, and, and then I'll go to James, maybe. I think, Andrew, you're precluded from this because I'm not sure that the government's buying quantities of beer. I may have got that wrong, but... Uh, no, no, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that we are seeing some success in that regard. Um, Highland Council, for example. Um, that, that's, that's a great example. Um, but, you, but, but we are... Um, I agree with what David said that we're sort of we've done the low-hanging fruit, and and now it's it's slightly easy, it was slightly more challenging to sort of go to the next level, um, breaking these contracts down into more um, bite-sized pieces, so that um, and looking at more collaborative opportunities is probably the way to go. James, James, do you want to contribute to that? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> not much to add really there, there at all. I think there are other opportunities. I think some innovation in how we do public procurement might help, to be honest. So if you've got you know, national contracts um, for some parts of the public sector, whether it's NHS or elsewhere, is there an opportunity to regionalise that? So in Dumfries and Galloway, could you pull your school's requirement, your hospital's requirement, um, your local council requirement into a larger regional contract that the suppliers might be getting into? I do think that the 49% figure, which is, I think is, is roughly the amount of public procurement spend that goes on Scottish suppliers, I think it masks a slightly better story than that, because there's a whole heap of products from oranges and fruits that we just cannot grow here. Um, so they're all into the mix as well. The percentage that we could supply for Scotland are, and are actually supplying for Scotland, I think, is, is higher than that. But I think some more innovation in that area. The real question will be, um, do we want to replace Thai chicken to be a bit provocative? So the price difference between what the Thais can charge for chicken versus what we can is huge. That, that gap has to be closed by local authorities being able to ring fence more spending for that particular area rather than us necessarily racing to fill what is a, a cheap commodity uh, product uh, going in. Although my aspiration would be it comes from Scotland at the right price, but it would need to be at the right price. Jamie, do you want to follow that up? Uh, thank you. Uh, not on that question, I'll move on to my next, if I may. Um, I think uh, we, we've touched on the issue of investment and innovation. Um, uh, and I, and I, I do wonder if I could push that further. I, I had the great um, pleasure and probably privilege of um, being on board one of Iceland's new trawling vessels earlier in the year. Uh, now, they're investing quite heavily in, in fishing vessel infrastructure. Over 200 million euros is being invested in 12 new trawlers. This particular one was uh, quite unique in the world in that it was a f uh, processing and freezing trawler, so it pretty much did end-to-end -end production on board the vessel itself. Now, that's a country which has taken investment and innovation using use of technology in food production to the next level, in my view. Now, we often talk in Scotland around investment in an odd vessel here and there in the news and it pops up periodically uh, in the press but you don't see that same scale Now I don't know if that money is coming from government or from industry or a mixture of both but what do you think Scotland could do more of to, to, to raise the bar in innovation, technology and food production? I'm going to start with you Patrick and then I'll probably open it <laughs> a little bit wider. We are seeing probably unprecedented investment in the catching sector just now we've, we you know um, I don't think it's a, a secret to say that the um, the order books and a lot of the built, boat building um, yards across
across Europe are, are full because um, there is the catching sector are achieving high market prices, or, or sorry, are good market prices. Um, um, I'm, and that's a result of, of the sustainability. I'm their their um, reassurance and their confidence in the industry and also within healthy stocks. So, so they are reinvesting in, in the sector. Um, where, where, the, where it falls down is the reinvestment within the processing sector. Um, and in terms of, of innovation within that processing sector, we need to look at how we actually add value to that product. Um, is that machine filleting? Is that sort of more automation within the processing sector? Um, to not only um, have more throughput through these factories, but also to upskill the workforce as well. To add to that, or I don't know if you've got another question, Jamie, on top of that. It, it, actually, it's, it picks up on a point that James made earlier around that the, the government's current um, method of spending little to many uh, could be uh, replaced by a spend more and more targeted investment. But wouldn't a byproduct of that be, for example, if you give £10,000 to businesses of two or three people that may encourage more, uh, more employment within those small businesses, more manual? I suppose, manual growth, whereas large-scale investment surely lends better to automating uh, industry to more industrialised production with less employment. Doesn't that address the, the, one of the issues around the, the, the lack of, of, of skills and resource that's needed at the, at the lower SME market? Uh, you know, I, I'm struggling to see which is the better option. Should you be investing in SMEs to encourage more uh, employment, or is it better to spend more in large automated industry, which reduces the cost of production and means you don't need as many people to, to do that, therefore facilitates your doubling of growth? James, do you want, do you want to answer that? Yes. Sorry, I there we go. James, do you want to answer that? And then I want to move on to the final question, because I know you all will have a, have a comment on it. So I'd like to take James's answer uh, to that and then move on, if I may, please. Yeah. I mean, if there's any consolation, we wrestle with that same with that same quandary as well. I mean, I, I suppose one of the the issues we have uh, in you know the food and drink industry is we're not as productive as as other countries, uh, and actually we've been less productive in in, in, in the food industry than other parts of um, the UK. But that's now improving, so productivity has risen quite sharply. And you know the 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 the, the blunt. A blunt view of productivity is less people but make more money. Actually, increases in productivity lead to increase in employment too. I think the, the innovation landscape, uh, if anything, feels more like a need for, for probably revolution than evolution with um, big data, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, robotics all coming. Um, there's a need to think very hard about investment of that. And I think the, the idea of a new advanced manufacturing centre in Scotland really is quite exciting and how that might serve the food and drink industry. I think the work that SMAS do and how that relates to the food and drink industry will, food and drink industry will be more important than ever. But that will also come with a skills requirement as well. Robots are only as good as the people programming them and working with them. So I think it's probably in reality a balance between, between the two, investing in workforce and investing in this new phase of, uh, of innovation. Can I make a, a very quick point related to this, which is to do with city deal? So one of the strengths, I would argue, in how Scotland has approached uh, food and drink, farming, fishing development is there's a sense of unity and, and common purpose. So there's a, there's a Scotland plan, a Scotland policy and a Scotland strategy. City deals are potentially an amazing mechanism to drive investment into, into our sector as well. My nervousness is... There are a number of city deals in Scotland, all, I think, with the exception of Glasgow, have talked about creating a food and drink innovation centre. So, in a sense, what a lovely problem to have, that there's lots of innovation centres potentially popping up. But there's a real question in my mind about how they work collectively and how they dovetail. So, as Scottish Government invests in these um, you know, city deals and food and drink innovation, how do we ensure it, it is creating national provision rather than regional competition? And I think you've got Rout and Abate following us, so that's maybe a question... For, for them. Um, I think they are, there's talk going on between them, but I think that's where we need to ensure that we have a real national view of how we're investing in these things rather than regional. Okay, I'm going to move on to the uh, last question, which is John's question. And could I ask, because I will ask each of you to answer it, and I'm going to start with James. Uh, so just so I prep, I'm going to work that way along the table. Um, could I ask you to keep it as short and succinct as possible? Because it is an important question. And I know you'll each have points on it. So, John. 
Okay, thanks, uh, Convener. I would just say on the procurement question, I think we should have Scottish craft beer in this Parliament instead of foreign wine and orange juice. However, uh, the, question is on, uh, <laughs> the question is on Brexit. Um, what, what are you concerned about around Brexit? It's been mentioned already. I mean, is it that we have no deal at all? Is it that we switch to WTO tariffs? Is it that exports have tariffs on them, or is it that exports get held up at the border, or there's a lot of uh, extra paperwork, capital injections were mentioned. Is it that we lose uh, migrant workers? Uh, we had evidence from Angus Soft Fruits that they would just move production overseas, or is it that we lose the cap money, or anything else? Just, sorry, uh, John's posed a, a lot of questions there, and, and, and it could take hours for each of you to answer them. Could I ask you to focus on, on, on the most important yeah. parts of that? Um, <laughs> otherwise, I think we could go off on a, a, a tangent. So, James. I'm going to say E, all of the above. Um, trade, labour, ag policy are the top three. I'll, I'll focus on, on trade, and, and my colleagues might want to pick up the others. David might, I think, maybe particularly talk about labour. Trade, 70% of all the food we sell out of Scotland that leaves the UK goes to the European Union. Um, it is the ball game at the moment as far as exports. Um, I, I've heard the phrase, no deal is better than a bad deal. No deal is a disaster. No deal is a bad deal uh, for us. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to contemplate. Different variations, different sectors. Whiskey will be fine. There will be no tariffs on, on whiskey. It will be about smooth operational things. For salmon, I think the tariffs are, are relatively modest, still important, but relatively modest. But if you want to export a beef carcass to France under WTO tariffs, you're looking at a 93% tariff. Uh, so our product suddenly doubles in, in price. Uh, and we've seen what happens before, particularly to our livestock industry, when European export markets have closed. They closed during foot and mouth, they closed during BSE. It's a disaster. No deal is a disaster in trade terms for us in terms of food exports. We need to build exports beyond Europe. We're doing that. But, you know, we need tariff-free access to the European market. D David, your challenge is to make it sure. shorter than James's answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll start with our four, which is uh, people, customs and tariffs, uh, regulation and prioritisation. And uh, uh, with James's cue, I'll talk about people. Uh, that's our biggest issue. You've, you've already alluded to the Angus Soft Fruits example. I've been to see the farm there, a thousand people, uh, mostly from the European Union, uh, uh, and it's a big issue. So the people uh, at all levels in our manufacturing industry are our number one priority and our number one concern about Brexit. Um, if I can pick up just slightly on regulation, um, all of the European regulation, and food is the second most regulated industry, uh, comes to the UK, and then there's a huge potential for divergence with Europe, divergence within uh, the UK with different uh, authorities as well. So all of that is a major concern for us going forward. Patrick. Yeah, it literally is all of the, all of the above. But um, in terms of the main thing is, is securing the raw material. Um, making sure that we get a good deal for 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 fish that come that comes into Scotland, um, followed by trade access to the markets, um, not only the European market but then also sort of collectively and pro productively working for for other export opportunities as well. So in Scotland, being the the, the the quotas being secured in Scotland. Oh, sorry, the quotas, right? Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, in terms of uh, non-tariff barriers, open access to borders. We know, for example, that if, if certain live shellfish products don't get to a French market within two o'clock in the afternoon, the price drops by 50%. So we need to make sure that, that those, those par barriers aren't, aren't there. And then the, the ongoing funding support, we've seen a lot of support through EMFF, and therefore something that's actually going to, to replace that, but with no delay and no barriers to, to make sure that there's a seamless transition. Scott. Uh, very briefly, two of your points, John. Um, exports held up at border be a disaster for us. Absolute disaster. That can't happen. So the, they need to get some form of agreement there. The idea that it can just be um, computerised to make it more efficient, that's not going to happen either. It, 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 we've got to maintain what we've got at the borders. Otherwise, we're going to end up with 40-mile queues uh, north of Dover, not the 17-mile mile queues we have at the moment. And the other thing is migrant workers as well for the processing plants who need that. Andrew. Um, for us, well, I mean, there's lots of unknown unknowns in all this as well. So, but the ones we're concerned about would be what's the impact on our input costs. So what are the, I'm not clear what tariffs the UK will impose on goods coming into the UK as a result of this. 
Um, are, are our raw materials going to go up as a result of that? Um, obviously, open access to other markets is very important for us. Um, and then finally, I'd just say that the um, EU support for industry, so the various grants and support that they can offer, um, how will that look after uh, we leave Zunglier? Okay. Thank you. Um, I think that comes to the end of our questions. So I'd like to thank the panel, each of you, uh, for giving the answers. If, if there's anything that you've missed out and you want to feed in, please let the clerks know. Um, <coughs> I had hoped to give you each an opportunity to, to, to make a short closing statement, but time, time prevents that. So if there is something you'd like to uh, let us uh, ponder on, please let the clerks know. So I'm now briefly going to suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow the panel to change and suspend the meeting.
Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, move on uh, to the second part of the meeting, which is also to take evidence, as we've been doing this morning, on the f food and drink industry uh, as part of our committee's uh, pre-budget scrutiny. Uh, I'd like to welcome Danny Kusick, the Director of Food and Drink, Tourism and Textiles, uh, David Oxley, the Director of Business and Sector Development, Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Dr Stuart Fancy, the Director of Research and Innovation, Scottish Funding Council, uh, Chris Brady, the Lead Head of Sector Development, Skills Development Scotland, Professor Peter Morgan, uh, the Institute Director of the Rowitz Institute, and Professor Carl Shashka, Head of School of Science, Engineering and Technology. Welcome to you all. The way, the way this works, if you haven't done this before, is you, you try and catch my eye if you want to answer one of the questions, and I'll try and bring you in. You don't need to worry about pushing any of the buttons on the screen in front of you, because the gentleman on, on your left and my right will, will pick you up and will activate your microphone. So I'd like to move to the uh, first question, which is from Peter Chapman. Thank you, convener, and, and uh, good morning, gentlemen. My question is the same question as we ha as I had to the last panel, and basically we're we're looking at an industry that has been a success over the last ten years, but the the uh, the ambition is to grow it, double it again to, by 2030 to 30 billion. Um, the question is, what do we, what does Scottish food and drink as an industry need in terms of support? to achieve that uh, change, step change in, in, in output? Uh, somebody's got to catch my eye, but if you look up, I might, uh, I might catch you anyway. So, Carl, you looked up first, so you, would you like to lead off on that? Well, first of all, it needs the, the people uh, for the industry with the right skills. So that's primarily the, uh, um, the, the requirement. Um, if we take the, uh, the, the, the range of products which are available, um, but we need to be able to process within Scotland with the right people doing the right things, with the right technologies as well. Okay, um, David, do you want to come in on that? Uh... Yeah, uh, I think uh, Carl's absolutely right. People is a, a key component of it, but I think if we're going to grow the sector over the next 12 years or so by doubling it, it's not going to be purely by price, so it needs to be about uh, capacity as well. Uh, so I think productivity improvements are absolutely essential, becoming more innovative. Uh, I think the people is going to be a challenge. Uh, we've talked a lot uh, heard earlier on about um, potential issues in uh, staff going forward. Um, so if we can get an investment in innovation to make things more uh, process-driven and productive, then we can actually perhaps grow the sector and grow the value of the jobs within the sector, which I think will be important to attract more people into the sector as well. Stuart, do you want to come in on that? One of the features of this industry from where we sit over the last few years and that I think we heard a bit about in the previous session was the, the uh, collaboration between the industry and those that are here to support it, including many of the people around this, this panel. So I think uh, one of the things the industry will continue to need is for us to work together and with it uh, to, very closely to make sure that we answer all the questions that David has just outlined. So, Chris, I'm sure you'll have a, a view on, on whether it's just people or, or, or the skills they bring. Sure, I think we heard this morning that actually what's important is that we recognise there's no one, sing, one silver bullet. It's not simply about people. Actually, there's a broad range of support required for the industry around innovation, market development, people and skills. I absolutely agree. You would expect me to agree is a, a really important part of that. Um, as an agency and working with colleagues of Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Funding Council, um, we developed a strategic skills investment plan for the sector in 2014. Um, that was work which was heavily informed uh, by Scotland Food and Drink and by a number of the sectors who we met from today. What that does, I think, is set out a shared vision between industry and government about where we think investment priorities should be in respect of people and skills. And I'm happy to talk about that further through the proceedings this morning. Danny, do you want to add to that? Yes. Just to echo the previous comments, it is around ensuring that we, we absolutely do create the right business environment and the right conditions to, to allow the sector to grow across the, kind of the key areas that were kind of identified earlier around our market development, around our innovation support, uh, around our supply chain development, around our workforce developments. So I think it's bringing all of those conditions and how partnership, agency and industry work together in achieving that. And I'm going to bring you in, Peter, because it would be unfair not to do so before I come back to the other Peter for another question. Yes, I would say that it's obvious that we can't 
do more of the same. We did, we've been very successful over the last few years. So that means there has to be a shift. And I think innovation is an undeniable requirement, not only because we've of the ambition 2030 targets, but if we've got Brexit going on in the behind the background, that's going to be another driver for change and innovation. And I think a third component is the fact that with the Good Food Nation Bill coming along as well, where we want to think about changing people's diets, uh, you, if we change those diets, the food industry is going to have to respond to that. So that creates a great deal of innovation requirements and needs, and you need, then need people to deliver it. Peter, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I'm interested in your, your uh, answers. I mean, people and innovation and, and, and marketing is all very important, but not, none of you mentioned the fact that we need more raw material. If we're going to double this business, we need more raw material, and that's, that comes back to the primary producer. And we've seen that, uh, you know, in farming in particular, the profit margins are very slim and are becoming slimmer. What, how can we grow double the, the, the food and drink industry without uh, some of that going down and, and growing the, the raw material? Uh, yep, yeah, sorry, Carl. Another dimension to this as well, which we haven't touched on, which is how we, uh, how we utilise uh, our waste. Since half the food is consumed, it's what do we do with the other half and how can we better use that? So that would add into that. Uh, whether that's um, production of biofuels for, biofuels, for example, or just better, better use of the, the food in the first place. I think that's another, another dimension we can look at. It's not just about having more, more raw materials. Uh, yes, Peter. So, uh, yeah, I think that your point is very valid, but, but I think that a lot of the research which is going on is about trying to make the agricultural system more efficient, uh, better breeding and selection, uh, reducing disease, the, the waste issue, I think a lot of these drivers are where the innovation is going to occur to actually enable us to get more out of the system. Okay, okay Danny, do you want to add to that? Yeah, so it, it, part of the, the consideration is around the kind of complexity of, of the sector as we see for the information. There's, there's over 17,000 companies which are classified as food and drink uh, companies within Scotland. The vast majority of those are in the agricultural sector, um, then it's followed by fishing and then the food and drink manufacturing processing. Uh, the last part of that only accounts for something like 6% of the company base, but generates 75% of the GVA and almost responsible for all the 100% of, of, of the exports. And across that wide spectrum of activity from primary users to the manufacturing, there is a great issue around our productivity across that sector. Uh, and at one end, we have a very, very highly efficient drink sector, which is £200,000 per employee per, per annum. At the other end is, is the primary agriculture at £14,000 per annum. So one of the key things about growing this sector, if we're absolutely able to tackle the productivity challenge across the entire spectrum of the supply chain, uh, if Scotland uh, has a productivity challenge uh, across all sectors, to go up to the upper quartile as OECD, we would have to increase our productivity by 27%. In food and drink terms, that would be increasing GVA by almost £1.5 billion. Pounds. And I think it's those kind of key things in, uh, around productivity which perhaps we do have to focus on. And we know the, we know the, we know the, 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 the uh, barriers around productivity, which are around investment, around internationalisation, around levels of innovation and around levels of workforce development and ensuring that we have the right people with the right skills in the right jobs. Okay, Stuart, do you want to come in on that? Uh, and it's different from last time, Camilla. We want to double the size of our industry. I dare say all the world's major producers of food want to do something similar. What distinctively in Scotland can we do that means we'll succeed where others won't? Stuart, do you want to, to lead off on that? I'll, I'll certainly try. I think we heard in the earlier session this question, uh, this uh, distinctive feature of provenance, the fact that Scotland has that story to tell of an, a, a food and drink industry which builds on, uh, on the, the purity of its raw materials, the uh, um, quality of the work that's done with those raw materials and clearly in the university sector and in the colleges in Scotland we want to contribute to that, we want to help our colleagues to contribute to that because by telling that story effectively and by contributing to the supply chain being both efficient but also distinctive in its quality that allows the industry to thrive and to, to compete in those international markets. I think our buy, the people who buy from us already know that they're buying quality they're not buying price. Yes. So what, how, how, how does it change then to make a uniquely different doubling of the market in Scotland? Is it simply a marketing issue we need to tell more people the story or is it something more fundamental about the way we do our business? 
I want to come in on yeah, that um, because, I mean, the uniqueness of Scotland on... on yeah, I think the, the food and drink sector is, is dominated by two particular aspects, the whiskey sector and the, and the, and the salmon sector, which are key, key to us. But there's a huge range of other companies and in, 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 uh, subsectors from brewing to uh, biscuits to bakers and all sorts of things. I think we can, we can help grow that by getting further growth in many of the, the other businesses that are out there. Uh, not, not to disparage the, the whiskey and, and the salmon sector, they've been fantastic success stories. We need to try and reflect that in some of the other, the other sectors. I, I live in Murray. Uh, Walkers is virtually on my doorstep, and you cannot go into an airport in the world without seeing Walker shortbread. So if we can encourage more people like that, uh, that would be a, a good way to do it. And I'm going to resist the temptation to say he's my next door neighbour and, and, and that it's an excellent product. So having not been able to resist that, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to, to, to Fulton with his next question. Mr Lyle's definitely weird enough and you can go. <laughs> um, thanks, uh, Camilla. Before I go into my uh, main question, I just wanted to pick up on some of the points here about innovation and productivity. We know that um, where there's gender balance in other sectors that... Um, that the, the, the productivity and innovation can be increased. Can you comment on the gender balance in the food and drinks industry and, and perhaps reflecting on the fact that today uh, the committee has been um, presented with 10 panel members that are all male? Um, I don't know if that reflects the higher end of the industry overall, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping not, but I, I'm putting that out there to, to ask that question today. Chris, do you want to lead on that? Um... Um, I was just looking through my extensive briefing for mm -hmm. details on gender imbalance in uh, apprenticeship frameworks, and that is one of the many things I'm sure I'll find out that I haven't been provided with. We can uh, write to you and provide you with details of how that plays out in terms of the apprenticeship frameworks. So I don't have those figures to hand. What I would say that it's something that we absolutely recognise as a challenge across apprenticeship frameworks. There are similar challenges as well, I'm sure, in college and university provision. Um, we're absolutely committed to addressing that. So we work with a number of organisations, including uh, Equate, for example, and a number of um, other organisations to actually address some of the, the root causes. The challenges very often are happening in the school system or happening at a very early age. So um, the, the addressing of gender imbalance is a key priority, but, but not a simple one. Carl, can I bring you in on that one, please? Sector, we're looking at that through Athena's One, for example, and uh, an equated. You mentioned Aurora programs, for example. Um, it's true that uh, the food science programs do attract uh, larger numbers of women than, than men, but then equally, the engineering, also associated with the, with food innovation, attracts more more men than, than women. Okay. Has been historical, but we are we are endeavouring to address that to make it more attractive to to uh, both gender. Full. Do you want to follow that up? I'm just wondering if anybody else, if any other speakers want to, to comment. Uh, Stuart. The, the, the Funding Council, working with our colleagues in SDS and in the two sectors, are very aware of the gender imbalances at the education end. And, of, and whilst it does start early, we are doing what we can with our colleagues in the sectors and with SDS through our Gender Action Plan to try to uh, do what we can to, to help rectify both of these imbalances, both the uh, if you like, excess of men applying to engineering courses and the excess of women applying to other, other courses. And, and neither of those balances are helpful. Imbalances are helpful. David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just specifically on, on Fulton's question around the, the balance today, I think that's a fluke rather than a, a reflection of the overall society. I, I sit in a number of aquaculture uh, in a, uh, committees and, and boards, and uh, the gender balance is, is improved, and I, I see that increasing uh, going forward. There's a, there's a number of um, probably females have got the industry 10, 15, 20 years ago are now much starting to progress <laughs> through the industry. If you'd looked probably 20 years ago, it would have been absolutely, you know, a lot of, a lot of male faces, but I think it is changing. Tani, does, does that reflect your, your, your experience? Um, from a sector perspective, I, I think the figures will, will show that, that there is a relatively uh, reasonable uh, gender balance across the sector from an employment perspective. However, I, I think like across all businesses, the key issue is around reflecting the gender balance within leadership aspects of, 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 of the sector. And, and clearly, I think uh, successful businesses are those ones which are able to absolutely harness all of their workforce. Uh, and I think there's lots of work to be done across the piece, not just specifically within food and drink. Uh, I think that'd be across the, the Scottish industry as a whole. Can I just say that I appreciate the, the panel's uh, honesty and frank uh, responses um, to that. And I think it was important to, to discuss because it's in the context of 
Um, there, are, there are other examples where productivity, innovation, as I said earlier, can be increased if there is gender balance. So I'm glad that, that that's been taken on board. Um, my other question uh, is, really, is just what I asked at the previous panel and relates to uh, the tax, taxation situation. You'll be aware that um, there's a national discussion going forward at the moment in terms of um, taxes, particularly relating to income tax, but not just restricting your answers restricted to income tax. Is there anything um, that you think that we can do overall to, to encourage tax changes that would support the industry? Uh, and if so, um, what do you think the, key, the industry's key focus should be uh, in relation to that, um, that debate or, or discussion? You're all looking down very <laughs> studiously. Um, D Danny, you had your head up, and, that, and I'm going to come to David as, as well from HIE. I, I, I think in the, the kind of, uh, in, a, in the generally competitive sense, what we want to ensure is that Scotland is 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 competitive as we possibly can be uh, for a number of of, 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 of aspects. What well, one is ensuring that we provide the right environment to allow those companies that are already here to successfully grow, develop, and and, and also be able to to invest. Uh, it's also around ensuring that we're able to attract the type of uh, foreign direct investment we'd want to see which supports this industry. This is an industry that, that, that has a, a large contribution um, of FDI component to it. So we want to ensure that we are as internationally competitively based as we possibly can to support that and at the same time ensuring that we are also um, um, a, a, a country that enables new start-up opportunities and investments in R&D uh, and allow those types of risks to be taken. So across that whole piece, I think the key considerations are around ensuring we create the best environment possible to allow Scottish companies and companies who want to come here and invest to be as successful as they possibly can be. David, and then I'm going to come to Carl. I'll take it into a broader context of tax. Um, prior to working for Highland Sands Enterprise, I, I spent 15 years in the brewing industry, uh, and I think we've seen phenomenal growth in the brewing sector uh, for quite some, some considerable time, and I think that was largely on the craft beers around the changes in beer duty, uh, which allowed many more smaller breweries to start up and then grow, uh, and I think that is a, probably a, an example of an innovative way of using tax to stimulate uh, growth in a particular sector. Carl, yes, thank you. Uh, um, just picking up on Danny's point, which is uh, which is a, a quite a valid one. It, there are a lot of um, very small food producing companies and a lot of new ones who would probably like to uh, raise the level of their business but are probably unable to. So help and support for those businesses uh, will be, be very welcome. But also through the use of universities and being able to provide that uh, help and support through innovation and being able to, um, business confidence and being able to uh, uh, upgrade their businesses. Um, I'm going to briefly bring in Richard, if I may, and then I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to Gail. That, that was a question I was going to ask, actually. Are we looking at this wrong, the wrong way? Should we not be uh, looking at firms who are not exporting at this time, encourage them, basically have these have an opinion on a regional allocated resources? Should the budget lines be spread over all parts of Scotland in order to help more firms, newer firms, export? Because, you know, there's a lot of firms that are exporting, but um, not enough. I want to come back on that. Yes. Well, that's an interesting one. I think um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping and supporting local companies, particularly new startups who may be based out in the rural communities, it's important to keep them in the rural communities to support those rural communities rather than simply bringing them into uh, the, the major cities where they may be able to have better opportunities for um, distribution, manufacturing, access to skills, for example. If we can actually encourage... Uh, new startups to remain in the rural communities, I think that would be, would be welcome. I'm not, I can't answer about the, the export question you asked, but I think that's, uh, that's an important aspect and we shouldn't forget that. I'm going to bring Danny in and then I'd like to take a quick question before I go to Gail from Mike. Important consideration for not just the food and drink sector, but uh, Scottish companies as a whole. Only 7% of, of Scottish companies uh, actually export. So for us to go up to the upper quartile, we need to at least increase that figure by at least 40%. Uh, Scottish Development International um, absolutely does uh, look very uh, um, 
the food and drink sector are, as a key consideration for them. Now, we mentioned before that we do have the in-market specialists, and I do think we have the foundations from a food and drink perspective to absolutely kind of capitalise and, and increase our export penetration. Uh, our Scott Exporter Initiative, which has been launched, uh, really is, is, is predominantly tried to focus at ensuring that we touch as many companies as possible. But through the partnership, uh, I do think the foundations are in, in place. It would be a great challenge within the partnership if our in-market specialists, uh, both in EU and outside, that we were having such a, 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 a demand for the services that we would have to look at how we increase that. But I think the infrastructure is absolutely in place to do that. The uh, in-market specialists uh, are predicted to increase export sales by over £100 million um, over the period of that programme. Mike. Okay. Um, with the food and drink industry having increased over the last 10 years by 44% and exports increased by 56%, doing a really great job and I think that your organisation should be congratulated for your input into that success of the food and drink industry. But if I could ask a similar sort of question I'd asked the previous panel, <coughs> public money is in short supply and this is a successful industry, it's received government support. Is it time, if, if, the, if, if, the, if the finance minister decided on, on reviewing his budget that it actually wants to redirect some of that government support elsewhere? to other areas, where do you think, in your organisation, it would be best to have a little bit of a reduction in? Is there any particular area where you could advise that it would hurt less if you had a reduction in a particular sphere of your organisation? I, who, who, I don't know who wants to go first. Everyone looked the other way when at the last panel, and you've, you've all done it again just now, so who would like to go first? Peter. Um, we already are taking um, reductions in budget already, so it's the pain we've been feeling for a few years. We, our, my institute, the Rowett Institute, as with a number of the other institutes funded by government in the rural sector, uh, have been taking 5% cuts each year, and then we had flat funding before that. So we have been experiencing that pain. I think the, the trouble with that continuing as it is, is that we, lend, we then lose the, the uh, critical mass that we need to have, the variety of researchers we need to actually input into the, to the uh, innovation agenda which is required by the industry. And then you get back to the other question, which is, well, should this industry be being pump, pumped up with uh, public money anyway? And I think the issue here is that um, the industry is not like the pharmaceutical sector where it makes great big profits kind of re put in money to, to reinvent itself. It does require a certain element of public priming. And, and you see that in other countries. You look across in the USA, uh, France, they've got public sector funding putting money into the agri-food sector. So I think we, if we pull too much money away, we'll live with the consequences down the, down the line. And what we've seen as success now, we will lose uh, in a few years' time. Chris, would you... Like sure. And I, I would begin by echoing the comments that Peter made. Actually, we operate in an environment where budgets are um, reduce, are at best static and most often reducing kind of year on year. I think that presents kind of two challenges for us as an agency. So one is, and, and there's a degree of complexity here, if we listen to the range of specific skills issues that have been, addressed, that have been highlighted to people from brewing and salmon and from the seafood industry, our challenge is to both respond to that and ensure that our work, uh, the investment that we put into the apprenticeship programmes actually reflects the need of industry. So our focus is, is very much about that alignment. I think the second thing for me is what a uh, 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 kind of backdrop of reducing budgets often leads to is that it can be quite difficult to find money to um, capture particular opportunities when they emerge. So as funding reduces, funding tends to get tighter in terms of what it's spent on, and that's a, a challenge I'm sure would be echoed across uh, my colleagues. I'll bring John in very briefly, because it doesn't look like anyone's volunteering to see a reduced fund, so maybe John. Uh, thank you, convener. Well, I think it's an excellent question from my colleague Mike Rumbles there, and I know some of the answers appear to have related to the internal structures, but of course at least two of the organisations here pay money out. So for instance, Mr. Uh, Kusik there, um, and I appreciate this will not be your area, but um, when, when um, represent uh, the Highlands and Islands, when crofters are, are struggling, when farmers are struggling with payments, people might be surprised, for instance, that Scottish Enterprise gave £2 million to a company that had made $3.14 billion, for instance, profit, Lockheed Martin, two years ago. 
Is that the sort of area where a, a, a focus more on a direct return rather than bankrolling obscene multinational corporations involved in the commissioning of death? Is that going to do with it, well, exactly. I think you've made your point, and I'm going to let Danny answer that very briefly, if, if, if I may, please, because I would then like to move on to now. Gail's thing. I'm, you have made your point, John. I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, familiar with uh, the actual project, uh, uh, John, but I, I would absolutely be, be, be convinced that there was an absolute rationale for, for that investment. Um, we invest in, in, in priority where we can absolutely see what the return of that investment is going to generate, either by the way of, of increased uh, investment from the company uh, in Scotland from an R&D perspective or in safeguarding or creating jobs. But there would have been an absolute very, very strong rationale for that investment, I can, I can assure you. And Danny, I'm very happy for you to leave your answer there. I'm going to move on to the next one, which is Gail Ross, at the Deputy yeah. Convener. Um, good morning, panel. Um, I'm going to um, speak about the, the first pillar in the 2030 strategy, which is people and skills. And um, Chris, you just said that apprenticeships need to reflect the needs of the industry. Um, so do you think that that is happening well at the moment? And how do we know that um, we are providing the right training and getting good value for money from the £37 million that the Scottish Funding Council currently provide? Okay. Um, I'd probably just say a number of things in, in, in terms of response. So uh, we, we fund some th somewhere in the region of about 1,100 modern apprenticeship starts last year. There's around about 3,000 modern apprenticeships in training across the sector. Um, a significant effort of my sector's team has actually been in ensuring we're developing frameworks that meet the specific needs of the industry. So we've developed a new uh, modern apprenticeship, as was referenced this morning, in, in craft brewing. Um, we have also um, looked at building flexibility into the food and drink manufacturing framework so that it reflects dairy, uh, meat and fish processing. Um, we've got a body of work underway in the development of new foundation apprenticeships. Um, so there's a food foundation apprenticeship, as you, you mentioned, in food manufacturing, which we think, actually coming back to one of the earlier points, may play an interesting role in terms of addressing gender imbalance. Some of the experience from the engineering uh, FAs is that we've had uh, much more mixed cohorts going through the FA than through the MA. Um, we've also um, just this week um, agreed that we're going to progress with the development of a graduate level apprenticeship uh, framework in food technology and food science as well. Um, on the apprenticeship family more generally, um, and there, were, there have been a number of questions around productivity today, and um, I think it was uh, Mr Stevens who asked the question, what might we do differently um, in Scotland? One of um, our observations, or one of the observations that I would have, if you look at high performing, um, highly productive economies, countries that we aspire uh, to be like the Austrians, the Switzerlands and the Norways of this world, they have much higher levels of work-based learning built into the post-16 educational system than, than, than we have. Um, so that's why I think the work that we're doing with the Funding Council and with the college and the university system to look at work-based learning approaches is absolutely critical to addressing productivity. Do, do you have a follow-up to that, Gail? Or, or, I mean, does anyone else have a... David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I think it's... it's and not, Stuart, yeah. It's not just about you know, entry-level uh, skills. I think we, we, and I'm sure Scottish Enterprise do as well, invest a lot of time in uh, leadership skills from emerging leaders to senior leaders to entrepreneurship skills. And we've seen some of the, the best returns on investment have come through that. I can think of an example of a, a Shetland-based muscle company that uh, we put through an executive education program and their, their growth has been exponential as a result of the, the ambition that they picked up from that and wanting to grow their particular business. Stuart, do you want to say something? You, you referred uh, to the investment we make in supporting both undergraduates, postgraduates and uh, college students uh, across the, the sector and it is uh, in this area, these areas of, that we're talking about here, about 700 students in the university sector uh, at the moment and about 7,000 in the, in the college sector, so it's a significant number, but the, the question, very good question about the link to employers' needs is, is, um, is one that we've been increasingly engaged in. Uh, uh, Chris has made some reference already to the skills investment plan uh, we've been involved with, uh, SDS, in building the 
Food and Drink Skills Academy, so bringing employers close to the educational establishments in order to establish that link between what is needed and what is provided. At the higher skills end, we've been working through the Innovation Centre programme, particularly in this context, in the one in aquaculture that was referred to in the first session, to ensure that uh, where we need master's level provision, where we need um, uh, PhD training, that that is done in partnership with the industry itself. So that link between what the industry needs and what the educational establishments are there able to provide is an extremely strong one, but one that we must keep an, a very strong focus on for all the reasons that we've referred to. I'm going to briefly bring in Jamie, if I may, and then come back to Gail. Thank you, Convener. Uh, um, just further to what uh, Mr Brodie said on um, improving productivity in Scotland, I note from our briefing paper uh, of the over £2 million that your, your agency spent on supporting food and drink, only £10,000 was spent on productivity improvement. Is that something maybe you could address internally as an agency? Yeah, ha happy to address that. The, the, the £2 million figure um, re reflects the range of activity that, that SDS is involved in. The majority of our um, programme delivery is actually in the apprenticeship family. Um, so the vast majority of that £2 million um, is focused on our um, apprenticeship spend. Uh, what we have done in terms of the food and drink productivity uh, piece that's referred to in the briefing is that £10,000 is a contribution towards a partnership piece of work that was delivered along with uh, Scottish Enterprise. So what we look to do is to, where we have discretionary funding, to partner up to ensure that we uh, can increase the, um, the impact and, of that funding. Gail, do you want to follow up? Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I think for, for a while now, um, we've been trying to persuade young people that it's a good thing to have a, a career um, in the sector. And um, Danny, you mentioned about getting the right people in the right jobs. Do you think this is currently happening? And I guess thinking of, of along the lines of the developing the young workforce scheme where uh, schools and colleges and universities and industry all work together, is there anything else that we could be doing better as to where the funds are allocated at the moment? I mean, I, I, undoubtedly, I, 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 there would be a recognition that we have to get more young people interested in the sector, right from primary uh, production right through to, to, to advanced manufacturing. And, and there's also recognition that within the sector it does present a myriad of career opportunities. And perhaps sometimes that's not fully recognised. So there is lots of work to be done. I think the industry itself would recognise that. It's a key, key part of the overall ambition around actually a, a responsible um, sector, which would be kind of the, the employer of choice so so whether or not you know we have to look at from grassroots level from schools right through to the universities uh, right through to the college system um, I, I think we have to kind of look at all of that uh, so, so there is uh, it's a key uh, a key element of what we have to do and I suspect probably Chris might have a, a better kind of recognition of, of some of the kind of conditional things we need to put in place but certainly it is a, a hugely important consideration. Chris, as you've been introduced by Danny, I, I, I think we should hear from you, but I'd also quite like to hear from Carl and maybe Peter <laughs> on that subject as well. So, Chris. Yeah, maybe just offer a, a, a few observations. I think first, the first thing for me is I, I think the most effective voice in terms of acting as a proponent for industry is industry itself. Um, and as a result, a lot of our work is actually focused on ensuring that we've got the industry representing um, itself in the best uh, kind of light forward. Um, we, we obviously run um, the National Careers Advice uh, Information and Guidance Service for Scotland. So food and drink is quite heavily reflected on My World at Work. We also provide um, localised um, information to our careers advisors that reflects the, the reality of um, kind of careers in different parts of the country. And it would come as no surprise that a lot of our, uh, a significant part of our work is focused in places like Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. We're working with the DYW group in Aberdeen uh, at the moment to look at promoting uh, both the processing industry, but also uh, the fishing industry as a career. And that, that issue of reach, I think, is, is critically important as well. It's about targeting uh, that activity in the places where there are jobs. Carl, would you like to... to... Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, we, have, we have to work hard to make sure that the industry, the food and drink industry, is the, indus is, is the industry of choice for, um, for youngsters from, from schools through colleges and attract them into the universities. Uh, I don't have any doubt that there's... Uh, a demand for our graduates, but attracting uh, undergraduates into our programmes is a challenge when they could go into other um, disciplines where there are 
uh, where there maybe seem to be more lucrative careers. So that is, uh, that is a challenge we face. But the industry is, is wide. It's not just in you know, food science or food technology. It's, it's process engineering. It's, it's many other different fields as well. It's, it's physics, for example. So it is very broad. It's very, uh, very wide. Um, but it is nonetheless something that we, we have been working on. Um, and we recognize that uh, uh, maybe non-traditional routes are, are what we need to be looking at. Routes into universities, I mean. Okay, Peter, would you like to? Yeah, so I, I think it's a very important point of how we entice uh, individuals into the industry, uh, and we've been giving that a lot more thought. As a, I mean, the Rowett Institute, which I'm part of, is part of the University of Aberdeen, so we're we're an ancient university, and we're looking much more at how we can uh, engage with uh, the, f the food and drink industry to understand their problems. And one of the things we are doing is talking about developing courses which will help. Uh, graduates who may, or people in the industry who may want to retrain through CPDs to, to bring up their skills, even if they're part of the industry. So there's a, there's a very active dialogue going on now, recognising the point that you're making. So we haven't got there yet, but we are definitely very much alive to the issue. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll move on to the next section, which is being uh, Rhoda Grant. <coughs> Thank you. Um, my question is about supply chain and traditionally we've had a long supply chain in Scotland with primary producers being some distance from their customers. Um, what can we do to deal with that making, to make sure our producers know what their customers want and indeed maybe shorten the supply chain to make sure that some of the profitability remains with the primary producer? Who'd like to start off on that uh Danny, probably you. Is, 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 it, I'll start with you, if I may, and then move on. One of the, uh, it, it, it's, as, as previously mentioned, it is an absolutely uh, fundamental component of, of what we're trying to do with respect to the strategy uh, around the supply chain and having a very, very effective supply chain from primary to, 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 to retail. Um, the market-driven supply chain is, is one initiative which we, we, we put in place to, in order to try and address that. Uh, that initiative, it's the second phase of it now, but really is primarily looked at how we get primary producers much more connected with either processors or retailers uh, in the basis of, of, of ensuring that there's a, a kind of much more cleaner uh, and, and a much more stronger linkage uh, from primary to, 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 to end user. So the more that we can do of that, the more that we can invest both at the research side with academia uh, and also with uh, companies, uh, then clearly, hopefully, that's one of the key things that we're going to look at from a point of view of priority moving forward. But we can do more of that, uh, but part of that also is, is around how we engage with the right companies uh, and also with the right, the right partners. David, do you, do you want to add to that? And then I think Stuart, maybe, I think it, uh, you, you might have something to add there, hopefully. David. Yeah, thank you. I, do. Uh, I think the... Danny's absolutely right, and I think some of the, the, the best examples of where we can help the supply chain in total is, is around um, meet the buyer events, so getting to know it, getting in front of the customer and seeing exactly what the customer wants and what, where the opportunities are, and that could be new product development, it could be about uh, accreditation in various uh, BRSE uh, accreditations, etc. but really understanding, making sure that the producer understands exactly what is critical to the to the, um, the customer is a very important aspect of it. Stuart, do you want to come in on that? The uh, future of the industry uh, will be supported considerably by innovation, innovation in business practices and products in, in, in various other forms of, of their activities. And in our support for that with the uh, universities and colleges in Scotland, we're extremely interested in, in ensuring that we're trying to help those industries uh, think of innovation at all levels in the supply chain where it exists in Scotland, so that those companies that are supplying uh, perhaps the, the big aquaculture, the big salmon firms, for example, that, the, that their suppliers are themselves being helped to be more innovative. So the Innovation Centre in Aquaculture, to use that example again, is as interested in, the, um, in, in supply chain problems and supply chain support so that those companies are, are, are um, Competitive in Scotland uh, at various levels of that chain, not just those at the at the at the um, at the, the top of it. Chris, and then we'll go back to a supplementary to Rhoda. I'm, I'm perhaps just going to pick up specifically on our kind of engagement with the agriculture sector, and and I, I mentioned that we've uh, twice worked with the the industry to develop a skills investment plan. Um, when we came round to um, the second iteration of that plan, one of the bits of self-reflection that, that we had with the industry was that um, 
the, the skills investment plan didn't, the first iteration didn't necessarily talk uh, to the challenges of the, the primary sector. So that was something we've tried to put right um, in the latest piece of work we did with the industry about 18 months ago. Um, one of the things that we were particularly interested in were some of the challenges uh, that farms in particular have around uh, attracting uh, people to work uh, into the business. And I think there's some specifics there around, and they sound very obvious, but the, the, the rurality of farms, the fact that um, it's very often family members who are their, their main kind of succession sources meant that they haven't been necessarily used to engaging with an agency like ourselves in terms of, um, for example, modern apprenticeships. So that some of the, the work that we've tried, tried to take to kind of put that right, we've now got um, the National Farmers Union and Lantra on the skills partnership, which drives the skills investment plan. We're looking at the development of um, pre-apprenticeship models and shared apprenticeship models, recognising that actually using um, the mainstream funding perhaps hasn't been as attractive. So I think we're, we're looking from a skills perspective to be as responsive as we as we can be. Um, Rada, would you like to follow up? Yes, I'm, I'm going to try and squeeze two questions into one. <laughs> um, the first part, would, would co-ops, would primary producers working as co-ops and marketing and maybe cutting part of that supply chain out work <coughs> for them? Is that something we could encourage? And given that 50% of the funding um, for the food and drink industry goes into supply chain, could that be used in a different way to kind of make it more profitable to the primary producers so that, you know, the money is going back to, to those that we need to, to be there working to, to keep our food and drink industry where we want it? Danny, by directing this question towards him, what I would say from a, um, from a, a skills perspective, the whole principle behind the shared apprenticeship model is exactly that. Um, so recognising that actually a shared apprenticeship model where an apprentice might be working in two or three businesses lowers the cost and eases the, uh, the cost of entry. So from, uh, that, that's absolutely where we're at. I think probably colleagues from High and Scottish Enterprise would be better placed to uh, address that question. Perfect. So, Danny, it seems to be ping-pong between yes. the two of you. I am actually going to widen it out, so, but I'll let Danny come in here and then maybe bring David in and anyone else who wants to come in, so yeah. Danny. Cooperatives do, uh, do and, and, and have a, 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 an important role to play uh, a, a across the supply chain. And there's some very, very good examples of that. So for instance, the, the Craft Distillers Association got together. Uh, there must be about 40 of, 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 of small craft gin makers get together uh, to effectively uh, collaborate much more uh, closely with one another and able to look at how they can access markets, not independently, but as collectively. We've done the same thing with the Craft, uh, Craft Brewers Association. Um, we have done some stuff with um, the uh, Raspberry Ray uh, uh, Producers Association in the UK in relation to uh, looking at various strains of, of, of through our market-driven supply chain. Uh, so there is a, 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 an absolute role for that. I think increasingly we can look at more, more ways to do that and, and more ways to, to, to involve whether that's locally or regionally or, or indeed sexually based um, uh, cooperatives and supporting their ambitions uh, around their growth and also potential to access markets which they may not normally be able to access as individual companies. David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, Rod, it's, it's worth just pointing out that there are over 5,000 uh, food and drink companies in the Highlands and Islands, and the number that are bigger than small or micro is 80. So there are vast numbers of small businesses, and getting to market is really challenging for some of those. And we have seen some great examples of where small producers have got together. Uh, the one that springs to mind is the Argyle Food, Food Producers Association, who've got together with a variety of different products and been able to market those effectively with a taste of Argyle type branding and going to, uh, to events and uh, uh, shows and everything to try and promote that. And I think there is a lot of benefit from that in that they can share skills and experience and knowledge and, and cross-sell. Uh, Ray, did you want to come back in and then I'll probably bring Stuart in? I'm, I'm just conscious that this is budget scrutiny and everyone's avoiding the, the, the budget question about is the money being spent in the right place? Stuart, that's you in the spotlight. <laughs> yes, um, before I address that spotlight, could I follow on the... Um, <laughs> so uh, we, we established uh, Interface to help very small companies um, meet uh, and reach into the academic base to, to draw value from it. And one of the things we learned is that the very smallest companies um, benefit from work doing that together in clusters. So Interface now have a, have a, a sectoral approach. And in the food and drink sector, they have established... 
uh, common interest groups that allows groups of very small producers to come together to access, uh, to work with universities and colleges to address problems that are common. So that's cheese makers, distillers, um, uh, rapeseed oil producers and, and so on. And of 200 companies have taken advantage of that clustering approach. So stopping short of cooperative or, 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 or very tight um, uh, structures like that, still clustering appears to be a very effective way to use money, uh, perhaps to address that point obliquely, and time effectively from very small producers who tend to lack both. Which question? Is it being used effectively? Well, I think we're using... Uh, public money very effectively. One thing I wanted to highlight is that that question came up a little bit earlier, so I'll bring back the question about how we're using public money with private money, because I think that combination is a really interesting one. And uh, with the big salmon producers, who've been a focus for discussion today, big salmon producers, they are investing an, a very high fraction of their own resources in their own uh, innovation future through the innovation centre that we've s set up. So we're not subsidising that work to a, to a very large degree, but they are investing in their own future, which seems to me a good relationship to have with an industry that is doing well. Does anyone else want to come in on that? Because I'd like to take a follow-up to... OK, John. Yeah. I think it is following on the, the way we're using the money, because um, I think it was Mr Cusick, you said 75% of the GVA is at the end can, or later stages of the, the chain. Um, and yet, at the same time, we're putting 438 million cap pillar one payments at the beginning of the chain to the farmers and so on. Um, and we're hearing that a third of farmers, uh, you know, are making losses and on the verge of going out of business. So if you bring that in as well, I mean, at the moment, we don't have control over that cap money, but we might have in future. So should we be, I mean, I'm, I suppose I'm torn because if the, if the later section is doing well, it doesn't need support or it, because the later section is doing well, maybe we should support it to do better? Danny, do you want to answer? I, I, I think the, the kind of key thing is around supporting opportunities. Uh, we, uh, from a Scottish Enterprise perspective, don't start a year with a, a food and drink budget, per se. Uh, we will have commitments from projects which we're supporting either through um, some of our programmes or, or through some of our, our company activity. But we, 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 we were based our, our funding on basis of, of kind of real kind of prioritisation, which is kind of demand-led, evidence-based. So if we can demonstrate that by contributing to a particular project, we're getting a, a significant return on our investment, that will be effectively the deciding consideration as to where we put, we put our resources. So I, I, it's really around uh, that kind of very, very strong demand, evidence-based input in, in relation to where our funding will get the biggest outcome from a Scottish PLC perspective, and that is about opportunities and whether those opportunities exist. Now, I suspect uh, right through the whole supply chain, you need a, a very, very healthy supply chain from primary right through to, to, to absolutely you know, final production and, and retail. And we have to ensure that it's the right balance across that that we, we, we get the resources into for the right interventions. Right, I'm going to bring Chris in and then move on to the next question. I, I'm very conscious I haven't been to my left side of the table or your right side, so you're not catching my eyes, so, but if you want to come in, please, please do let me know. So, Chris. I'll, I'll just make three very quick observations about our, our funding. So, one, I would agree completely with what Danny said. Our, our, the principle of co-investment in the apprenticeship frameworks is critical, so we make a contribution to training employers, make a financial contribution, as well as a contribution in terms of paying wages and recruitment. Um, I, I would argue that our um, apprenticeship, fam, uh, apprenticeship work is very uh, clearly demand-led as well. Um, we have actually gone through a process with the food and drink industry, but a whole range of other industry sectors where we have taken out um, the evidence that we see in terms of where we think demand is, and we look for industry to validate that before contracting. That's a, a, a piece of innovation, if you like, into our contracting methodology that we hadn't previously done as explicitly. Um, I think the uh, third, third element I'd kind of pick up on is, and I, I would reflect on some of the conversation that we heard from James and others this morning, um, the engagement that we have with Scotland Food and Drink and with the range of industry bodies who were here today is absolutely critical because that gives us a mechanism for actually posing the question, are we investing in the right places? So the skills investment plan is not an SDS document. We haven't determined what we will do. That is a very clear ask from industry in terms of where they think priority should be in respect of skills, as well as a clear commitment from them in terms of what their responsibility is as well. Um, Carl, I'll... I think that um, industry, the industry, uh, no matter what size it is, um, fully understands what support can be gained from uni the university sector 
And I think that's, uh, that's, that's missing at the moment. Uh, well, it's not missing, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not utilized as to its full potential by a long way. Okay, an, an interesting point, and probably the best place to leave that, move on to Jamie with his, with his question. Thank you, Convener. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the ambition is to double the Scottish food and drink industry to 30 billion by 2030. Uh, let's uh, assume that in the pending budget, your agency budgets don't double. How do you think your agency will contribute towards helping Scotland PLC meet that target? Um, Peter, do you want to start with that? Yeah, well, I, I, I represent the Rowett Institute, but it's one of six institutes funded by Scottish Government to do research which underpins the agri-food sector. Now, what we, we've been doing that for years, but what we've done this year is to bring those bodies together under a one single umbrella called Safari. And the reason for doing that is because we want to help the food and drink industry understand what we do more effectively. So it's actually made one single gate through which we can talk to Scotland Food and Drink directly, which we've already done, about how we can help them deliver Ambition 2030. So we, we need to have a common discussion and language so that we, we know what their problems are, they know what we can help them deliver with. So we, we're taking an active approach to that uh, and changing how we're operating. Okay. Um, David, do you want to...? I, on, just on behalf of my finance director, I'm, I'm happy to take a 50% rise in budget if that's what's being offered <laughs> instead of 100%, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that's quite not the case. But in terms of where we would prioritise it, I think it, it, there's probably two, two or three areas. Firstly, absolutely on innovation, we need to get as much, a, a best return on investment from our, from our business. We know that some of the challenges that uh, the, the sector and other sectors are going to face is about uh, a tight labour market going forward. Uh, that, that will mean, uh, I think somebody mentioned, uh, a, a revolution in terms of the way we, we do things in the sector. We're seeing evidence of that happening. There's lots anyway with drones and uh, the use of sensors on lots of industries uh, within, this, within the sector. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. I think we can work very collaboratively with some of the innovation centres, it, but it's not just about the ones that have got food in the title, like Scottish aquaculture. I think census and data labs mm -hmm. have also got a role to, to play in the, in the use of this. Uh, and I think also uh, there's a big market out there, and I think it was mentioned in the previous discussion, that some of our products can't get into some export markets because of, of restrictions. And if, if things can be done to, to change that, then we can potentially, that's a good way of growing, growing the sector. The one thing that I think the food and director, when we do a regular survey of businesses, food and drink sector is probably the sector that is most concerned about Brexit, uh, A, from losing people, and uh, B, potential tariffs. So I think it's a real big challenge uh, for that sector. But if we can get more folks exporting now, while it's relatively straightforward, it's going to be a lot harder, whatever the outcome of Brexit is in, in 18 months, two years' time. Uh, just on Brexit, there will be a question coming up on Brexit, so I'm, I'm happy if we move. Je Jamie, do you want to follow up? Because I know Danny and, and Stuart want to come in. So sure, if you'd like I, mean, to it, I think... Uh, uh, Mr. Oxley raises a valid point around innovation. Um, innovation is one of the three pillars of Ambition 2030, but it receives less than 10% of public finance spend on food and drink. That seems quite a disproportionate ratio if it's such an important part of the ambition. Do you have any views on that? Yes, I, and, and, and I think uh, it, it's recognised across the piece uh, from a food and drink perspective that the levels of innovation uh, are, are incredibly low. I mean, the are levels of innovation across Scotland as a whole are low. Uh, now, in some, some respects, that's the way that we capture the information because birds are a pretty blunt instrument, but, but at least it's a proxy. It was one of the reasons why the Make Innovation Happen initiative was absolutely uh, uh, established in order for us to increase the levels of, of, of bird and innovation business R&D into the sector. Uh, and, and that's only, we're only kind of um, uh, less than a year into to that programme, but we can absolutely see now. So if I look at the figures that are in your SPICE report from last year, the, in, the funding on large R&D grants went into the food and drink sector from Scottish Enterprise were very low, at some, just less than a quarter of a million. I know now that the pipeline of which projects, which we have confirmed on large R&D, are now over two and a half million pounds. So our budget for next year will be very, very different based on our commitments of those projects. And that is around how we actually are trying to stimulate uh, innovation activity within the sector. And by doing that, innovation, uh, stimulate innovation activity across Scotland as a whole. 
clarify a point. Isn't the Make an Innovation Happen <clears throat> project only a budget of around 1.1 million over but, three years? But, I mean, again, isn't that just scratching the surface? But that, that budget uh, uh, is really to, to act as a catalyst, as a stimulus, as a feed up, so that the key funding for projects will come from our existing large grants, uh, R&D mechanisms, including our smart. So that will be effectively um, the, and make innovation happen isn't the, the only budget we'll, we will use to support. It's really there to stimulate demand, of which hopefully then we will see much more larger R&D grants coming into the main, the main, the main part of the system. And uh, as I say, we're, we're sitting with a couple of projects which we are about to conclude, which uh, if they do go forward, and I'm, I'm very uh, uh, confident that they will, it will increase the bear just by two projects by almost half of, of the current entire bear for the sector. At the moment. Stuart, followed by, uh, uh, I think Peter wanted to come in, so Stuart. So one of the things that we should do and must do is to continue to invest in research as the underpinning knowledge generation from which the innovations that uh, the industry can benefit from uh, can be drawn, so that's extremely important. Uh, similarly, we should uh, continue to invest in demand-led innovation support of the kind that my colleagues have been talking about. So working with the industry to ensure that the, uh, re the responsiveness of the academic sector is there for them through mechanisms such as the ones we've talked about, uh, interface innovation centres and others. And finally, I wanted to highlight something which I think is extremely important for the coming period, which is to work with the opportunities that the UK government's large amount of funding through its industrial strategy challenge fund offers to Scotland. And we've already seen SRUC be a beneficiary in large partnership looking at the future of agritech. So there's very large amounts of resource available there for us to work with in that area and also in the area of city deals, which we mentioned also earlier on in the discussion. Peter. I think the, the, part of the issue of the uptake or, or with the, the investment going into research which could be picked up by industry in Scotland in the, food, in the food sector is a lot of the companies are very small and getting some of that innovation in the large scale projects is quite difficult. I think the common interest groups is a very important development where you can bring together a number of parties who, where the research can make greater impact. So I think the, this is a vehicle which I think will make a big impact and could be quite transformatory for the future in terms of going towards the 2030 goals. Okay. Um, the, I think there's the, the question that uh, I said was coming later is, is about to come up. John. Yes, and that is about Brexit, which has been mentioned both in this panel and the previous one. I think it... Um, Mr Oxley, you said your two concerns about Brexit, or your two primary concerns, were losing people and uh, perhaps tariffs. So I just wonder, yourself and others, uh, would these be the main concerns? Uh, what about you know, not getting students coming here or even postgraduates? What about losing research funding? What about the cap payments being reduced? Um, and then, you know, if there's no deal at all, is, is that a concern around tariffs and uh, moving goods across borders? I suspect each of you will want to comment on that. So to save myself being predictable, I'm now going to start on my left, your <coughs> right, with Carl, and work that way round the table. So, Carl, if you'd like to Thank start on that. Thank you, Edward. Um, you're right. It, there is a high degree of uncertainty within the higher education sector. It is about uh, uh, issues associated with collaboration in Europe, uh, the ability to lead projects uh, with our European um, uh, colleagues. It's about attract, the ability to attract uh, European students into our universities, which is a, a major um, um, part of our business. Two other very important areas are about the ability to attract European staff. About a quarter of my staff are, are from uh, overseas, including the European Union. Uh, and also um, the ability to retain staff as well, a high degree of uncertainty with uh, the staff, staff who are currently uh, uh, here. And then there's other issues associated with opportunities for internationalisation within our universities through university exchanges uh, either into Europe uh, or, or from Europe uh, to us as well, which again enriches our, um, uh, our universities through interna internationalisation. So um, all of these are being addressed or would like to be addressed, I, I, I think. Um, but uh, where we go from here uh, is, is a little bit unknown, I have to say. But there is certainly a high degree of uncertainty, and it's, and it's not a good position to be in, I have to say, particularly for some of my um, uh, European colleagues. Peter. I would echo many of those comments. I mean, in, in my institute, we've got between 25 and 30% of people are European. 
they feel very destabilized right now and uh, whether they wish to stay in the future is, is an open question. So uh, that's part of our leadership in terms of the, the, the scientific leadership we have. It's often a sim even a higher figure when it comes to PhD students. Uh, they have very many from, from Europe. Uh, so getting the most talented people doing what we want to do is a difficulty. There's then the issue of money, grant income, which we're very successful in getting. Uh, if that is no longer available to us, that's a serious slug of money which is, is lost. And then that also loses the collaborations which we built up over many years, not just for academic collaborations, but just in collaboration in all sorts of senses. So the, the ramifications are huge, and that, that leaves aside the other aspect, which is students from EU, which is a major intake uh, issue for, for Scotland, and particularly in, in the University of Aberdeen. So the, the ramifications are enormous. Uh, I don't think we can underestimate it. Chris. I sure, probably reflect specifically on some of the potential labour market implications. So a, a couple of things we probably recognise is that um, the food and drink sector is um, in, in some places, in some parts of the country, and in some subsectors quite heavily reliant on migrant labour. And that question of uncertainty, I think, is critical. So I think in the absence of clarity on whether people have the right to remain, whether we have a, a clear kind of immigration policy that's differentiated for Scotland that reflects the makeup of our industry, I can understand why uh, kind of businesses feel uh, concerned about that. And I think we heard some um, very clear concerns from James and others this morning. Um, I think in terms of labour market implications, we, we also probably want to look at, at, at two other directions. So one of the questions that we're wrestling with is, will does Brexit actually have the potential to uh, lead businesses to look at other ways of meeting their uh, production needs. So is it going to be a driver for automation? Potentially it might um, pick up the pace in terms of the response of businesses. I think there's also um, an opportunity to be thinking a bit more clearly around the question of kind of labour market participation and economic activity. And I think if, if labour supply is turned off, you move to a position where actually re-engaging people who are not in work becomes a business imperative as much as a kind of social imperative. So I think we need to be looking a little bit to the medium term and the longer term and thinking when things become clearer, what might the policy responses be that we need to think about? Uh, Stuart, I think Chris has probably posed three questions there back. I hope he hasn't taken one of yours, but uh, please... I was going to, to echo Carl and Peter's earlier uh, comments on on, uh, on the risks, and uh, they, they, they outlined very well the research staff, research funding, uh, students' issues. So I'll take one of the, take that a little bit further, and then raise a, a second one if associated with Brexit, if I may. So if we take the if we accept that there is a risk that a large number of our research staff may not come here from the European Union in future because they currently do and may not be feel so welcomed, then that actually impacts on our overall research quality as, a, as an academic, uh, a very academically highly thought of country. And that's a vicious cycle potentially where more and more people may not regard us as highly as they have done in the past, which reduces foreign direct investment attraction. It reduces um, the, the flow of international people from all the way around the world. Which takes me to my second point, of course. One of the fears that we have about Brexit is that its reputational effect on United Kingdom is that it makes the whole country feel as though it's less welcoming generally and therefore Scotland does need to work hard and, and the academic sector is working hard to, to retain that sense that it welcomes uh, staff and students from all around the world, countries that are not Brexit affected directly but of course need to feel welcomed here in an environment that well there is a concern might not be quite as welcoming for them. So the Scottish academic sector is working hard that way, we're working with them but it's an important wider implication of Brexit to countries beyond the European Union. David. I think the availability of migrant labour has been a, a hugely important part, uh, aspect of, of not just the food and drink sector, but the wider Highlands and Islands economy. We, over the last census survey, we saw virtually every part of the Highlands and Islands growing its population, uh, which was really good to see. And a lot of that has been on the back of uh, people coming to the Highlands and Islands. Uh, I think picking up on, um, I think it was Peter or Chris's point earlier on about uh, what changes in terms of a driver for automation, I think absolutely that, that's something we're going to see more of. If it, in, a, in a worst case scenario where lots of people disappear in a very short period of time in order to keep production levels up, they're going to need, they're going to need to be huge investment in automation. And I think there's, a, there's perhaps a, a sectoral attraction benefit of that. If, the, if automation means you need higher quality staff, perhaps getting paid more, 
better skills, and it'll, it'll become a more, more attractive industry for our young people. And finally, Danny. And to, just to echo what's been said, uh, the, the, the uh, considerations around constraints on the industry are, 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 are around workforce uh, and, and availability of labour, uh, also tariffs. On the, the tariffs aspects of then our focus will be around how can we support companies to, to navigate through whatever Brexit comes out at the end of it from the point of view of regulatory uh, requirements, but also really important about diversification of markets. So that includes non-EU markets where we already have a presence either from an STI perspective or from our own market specialist and how can we do more in those markets in North America and Middle East and Far East, uh, but also how can we do more in the rest of the UK. So we shouldn't forget that this is a hugely important market for, for, for food and drink products. And then longer term, I get into the whole uh, uh, labour issue, I think things like automation and advanced manufacturing are absolutely going to be critical. Uh, they will accelerate, I think, the need for companies to look at this now very critically. And uh, now with that, there is uh, whole levels of, of new innovation and high levels of productivity, but there's also a, a danger also that, you know, that in itself will, will lead to you know, less people being employed in the sector, or indeed we then have to look at how can we migrate those people to more highly, more value-added type jobs and roles. So I, that will be, I think, the key consideration from a, from, from a perspective of how we address that in supporting companies. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you all of the panel for, your, for the answers you've, you've given today. If there is something that we've missed and that you feel is important uh, for the committee to consider, I would urge you, as I did the previous panel, to write in and let the clerks uh, have your views so they can make sure that we, we get them and, and, and they will do that. I mean, I think it's been a very interesting session. I'm not sure, David, you will have got your plug-in for a 50% increase in your budget, but it, it was a nice try. But thank you very much for all your input. Next, our next meeting next week will consider a transport update from the Minister of Transport in the Islands and some uh, statutory instruments. And so that concludes our meeting today. Thank you very much.